Welcome to the Cincy Postcast. I'm your host, Kevin Wallace. And before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Streetside Brewery, a fantastic local Cincinnati brewery, one of my favorites. And believe me, I've tried them all <laughs> here in Cincinnati. Their location in Columbia Toss Club is top notch. One of my favorite places to go out and catch a game. Uh, we are so excited uh, that they've been partnering with us this season. And I am excited to tell you about their Speak of the Devil Day celebration happening on April 13th. This is a huge event for Streetside, and I want anybody and everybody to get out there releasing Speak of the Devil. They will be open at 10 a.m. They have Kraft Burger Bros. slinging some breakfast starting at 8 a.m. The Dead Man String Band will be there from 10 to 1. Uh, and if you purchase a full allotment of Speak of the Devil, uh, they even have devil-themed chocolate truffles from Ruby's Chocolates. This is a cool event. They do it every single year. Check them out. Again, that is Saturday morning, April 13th. Uh, it's a fantastic place. Go check it out. Uh, and yeah, next time you're you're looking for a place to watch an away game or you're looking for a beer in uh, your local uh, beer fridge, grab Streetside Brewery. You will not be disappointed. And boy, do we have a full, full, full episode for you. In part one, we dive into a just about the nerdiest thing we could possibly think of, which is MLS roster rules. U22 spots, designated players, they are all changing this mid-season, not this off-season, this mid-season. How does this change what Chris Albright is able to work with in restocking this team for a potential title run? We discuss all of that in part two. We sit down with Tyler Snipes, writer for MLS Soccer. He also in the past has covered FC Cincinnati and MLS Next Pro. We discuss his latest article about Frankie Amaya and Frankie's reception at TQL Stadium. He's got some really interesting tidbits about that article, what happened behind the scenes. Also, a great conversation about the MLS Next Pro team. Should you be worried about FCC2? And then finally, we touch on a preview and predict the Montreal match this weekend. You put it all together, and like I said, you have a very hearty helping of postcast. Joining me to talk about all of that and more, I've got two gentlemen who are ready to dive headfirst into all the weirdness that is American soccer and MLS going on around the league right now. Joined by the Chief, we are once again joined by Grayson. Grayson, did you enjoy your time away? I always got to ask you. Theo, I always enjoy my time away. Okay, good. <laughs> Wait to say, I don't know if that's good for us, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> he's the only podcaster that has more fun when he's not podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they said, like, if the object of golf is to play less golf, the object of podcasting for Grayson is to podcast less. <laughs> Yet here we find ourselves routinely doing two hours on a Wednesday. So <laughs> my uh, my favorite part about not having Grayson on the podcast is when Grayson does eventually listen and he sends us all of the things we got wrong. I, yeah. That's my favorite part. Ah, <laughs> oh, Grayson, this is why we keep you around, man. I, I messed up the team that got involved with the uh, Philly, by the way. That was good. So, yeah, no, it was a good time. <laughs> yeah, he's either he's either a co-host when he's on or he's stat boy from PTI when he's not. <laughs> Hey, Reality turned that into something big for himself. So <laughs> yeah. people forget Max Kellerman was the original host of Around the Horn. He was Reality, and he was so good at it, too. He really was. The show was <laughs> at its peak, at its apex when Max was in charge. Tony Reality is the like uh, kind of Andrew Weeby of. <laughs> ESPN TV shows. I really like. I, I really like reality. I I think Weeby could grow on me, but yeah, there's something to that. All right, Kellerman. Kellerman's like. I don't know if he still does this. Was like the only guy at ESPN who still remembered how boxing worked and like could talk boxing. Um, 
and that yeah, they kept giving him they kept giving him boxing shows where it was like the running gag was is that who does Max Kellerman have the goods on at ESPN <laughs> yes. that they keep giving him TV shows to talk about boxing. <laughs> Kellerman is a great boxing commentator. Yes, he's one of the few guys that still like actually enjoys the sport too. But that that, that goes such a long way when you just are enthusiastic about the product you're covering. That was always the bitch about ESPN with soccer yes. was that they would put people on to cover soccer who clearly had no, their passion for the game had died at some point. And you could just tell that they don't want to be here. So why do I want to be here? Whereas with Max, the minute he starts talking about welterweights, it's like, I don't know who any of these people are, but now I'm interested. Yeah, right. <laughs> that passion's infectious. All right. And uh, it plays better than, I don't know, a uh, sports center host mispronouncing, you know, Ronaldo's name. That's always good. Yeah. Those, those moments that would come up. Yeah. <laughs> the best one that I, I'll, I'll always remember is that after the, because I recorded this game on the DVR uh, back in the day, after the FC Cincinnati Chicago Fire matchup yes yes where it's this incredible oh. penalty kick shootout in front of a sold out crowd lower division soccer mitch saves all these kicks it's it's pandemonium and they go immediately to sports center because the game had run long obviously having extra time and pks and the announcer whoever is the host of sports center immediately shits all over the game that was just broadcast and pivots to a baseball highlight like yeah <laughs> that wasn't the most exciting thing ever <laughs> i think he says something along the lines of wow those folks look like they're having fun anyway we turn to you know the blue jays red sox and you're like whoa man <laughs> that's the most compelling drama that's been on espn one uh in some time and yet <laughs> it's just casually dismissed so yeah. cool I can't no, imagine why MLS wanted to ditch these, you know, super valued media partners that are so important to their success. And then the uh, the game we played against the Red Bulls in the next round of the Open Cup couldn't be shown on ESPN because they were devoting 24 hours straight to fantasy football coverage. <laughs> That's right. They got bumped for fantasy football preview shows. <laughs> Not just fantasy football preview shows, but a specific thing where it was 24 hours straight of fantasy football coverage <laughs> with right. a running clock in the corner as to how many drafts had happened on ESPN.com during that time period. <laughs> One of the things that, that you got to appreciate about like the growth of soccer popularity is that it was like a thing in every market for local, local media guys just to shit all over soccer. Like it was like a very easy joke to like make. And um, now they have to cover it. Yeah. And you know they hate every second of it. A hundred percent. Which it's, I enjoy, like knowing that they're not having a good time. <laughs> I, it's, it's right up there with like women's sports becoming, you know, growing into their own. Right. It's like how many of these guys are now like, oh, now I got to cover women's college basketball now. But like this at, is at not what I signed still, up for. At least it's still college basketball. Right. And right. Still, right. Like your 15 things you know about basketball still translate from one to the right. other. Oh, they're not moving enough on this set or they need to get the ball down low and work the low block. Like these are right. all things that you can just sort of spout endlessly on talk radio or, you know, say whatever. There is just not enough. We've, we've, I think we've talked about this before that the reason why they hate covering soccer for the most part is none of them know the game well enough to say what's going right or what's going wrong beyond uh, FC Cincinnati should score more goals, which to be fair is us as well. Right. But we do it with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll say this about, about like women's college basketball specifically, cause it's like just top of mind because it's, right. it's, you know, the tournament just ended. You can tell it's like, you can tell that it's farther ahead than soccer because like the, like a certain kind of sports journalist has figured out that the sport is popular enough that you can get a whole bunch of negative engagement by even just like low effort hating. Yes. Um, like being like, well, it's okay to turn off the women's tournament at halftime. It's just not for everybody. Like that guy, he knew what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. Like he knew that by doing that, he would get like 
all kinds of engagement with this tweet. And I haven't really seen people outside of soccer figure that out. The corollary to that is that people within soccer media have figured out that if you go after FC Cincinnati, you will also yes. get a lot of engagement, which tells yes. you like where we are in the in the soccer landscape. <laughs> Although there is there is a weird correlation between the soccer world and the women's basketball world specifically. And that's with the takes that I'm starting to see online now that Ooh. just inject them directly into my veins. I'm so excited about this of I feel sorry for Caitlin Clark because she's going from a massive stage down to the WNBA. And that feels she's gonna so challenge st- herself in Europe, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like go sign with Ice Cube's the big three so you can challenge yourself against the best in the world versus going to the WNBA. And boy, if that doesn't have the exact same energy as oh, to feel bad for Christian Pulisic, got to go to MLS now. It's like, what? <laughs> that's a good point i think there's some there's some comparison there too with the uh the tweets i'm seeing of people praising uh usl for for getting what looked like a hundred thousand more viewers on cbs versus fox for mls when uh mls went up against oh i don't know the championship game of the ncaa tournament or no it was the final four going up against the final four and wrestlemania yeah, that's good. Uh, Does, just point of reference, though, real quick. Uh, getting in the sub 500,000 numbers uh, on any network television is horrific, and everybody should be embarrassed. Sorry. Go ahead, Grayson. Um, does women's professional basketball in Europe have pro rel? I'm going to say yes. It feels like it does. Okay. I think, so, I think what we need to start doing is demanding the WNBA Institute pro rel. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like there's a there's a take here that we're going to lose ground to Europe, you know, because like, you know, Kelsey Plum, like all these players, they play in Europe as well. Right. Brittany Griner. Yeah. Brittany Griner. I was trying. I was sticking away <laughs> from that. Because <laughs> I think uh, I think Kelsey Plum played for like I, I was looking this up the other day just for no no real good reason, just because she came on TV. And I was, <laughs> um, and I think she played for like like Fenerbahs or some or one of those like Turkish yeah. uh, Turkish clubs that like you know you know they have like the the multi sport yeah um, yeah the uh, Greek teams all do institutions that. over there the Spanish teams do it there's like yeah she yeah. played for she played for Fenerbahs and Galatasaray whoa and live to tell the tale wow. oh man <laughs> I think that's what FC Cincinnati needs to do incidentally I think. Instead of building out, and we're going to talk with with Tyler Snipes later in this episode about the FC Cincinnati 2 situation, I think we should start developing other sports just to see if whatever the next one is that hits. So, like, let's get a professional lacrosse team. That's FC yeah. Cincinnati lacrosse. Let's get a women's basketball team. Let's get a rugby team. Let's get an Aussie rules team. Just let's get an eSports oh, team. Let's keep netball. going. Netball. <laughs> netball. Netball. I am aware that's a thing. Like, basically, (laughs) anything they'll show on that one week where it's ESPN 8, the Ocho, let's get an Ultimate Frisbee team and call it Ultimate Frisbee to piss off everyone. Like, no, it's actually Ultimate, you know. Um, You know what they should do? Get get the World Soccer Talk crowd real pissed at them. Put a team in TST, right? Yeah. Because then people are going to complain that, like, that they are audaciously... You know, stepping on the turf of the Natty SC. <laughs> like like they're trying to team. these MLS trying to kill independent soccer. <laughs> I love the idea of FCC sending a competing team to the Natty. That's great. <laughs> I think the team that they send to the Natty should be they should put a shitload of money on the table and get every person that hated their time at FC Cincinnati and pay them so much money that they have to show up and play for FC Cincinnati and TST. Get like Brenner, Barial, um, no, Frankie I was gonna say, I was going to say, well, like, I was going to say like you get Fernando Adi. Fernando Adi. Yeah. <laughs> you get Fernando. Darren Maddox. You get Roland Lamar. I assume get- Fataya Lache has no warm feelings who, who about us. The, you still got to work, man. You still got to work guy from- Lance uh, Lang. Lang Slang. <laughs> <laughs> Lance Lang, today is a good day. <laughs> Andy Craven, Tommy Heineman. 
<laughs> Tommy, Tommy Heineman. Tommy, Tommy Heineman's the coach of this team because clearly his knees won't let him play. <laughs> yeah, it's the TST. You don't need knees to play it. That's true. Man, an <laughs> FCC villains team would be great. No, it's F. FCC. It's, it's fuck FC Cincinnati. <laughs> FFCC. <laughs> That's a like, good team. Like, oh, they just like the first financial club, I guess. No. <laughs> no. We'll see if Frankie and Maya can, can get there on loan. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, is there any FC Cincinnati news for us to cover this week? Uh, no, at least not immediately. Uh, we'll is touch Kelsey, on it. Is Kelsey here yet? Sure isn't. Also, Kelsey is, Plum? Not her either. Um, Kevin Kelsey, in this case, uh, not playing for Shakhtar Donetsk, although it's not clear that he would be anyway. So I dated a Kelsey for a while. Didn't turn out well for me, but you know. <laughs> I'm going to say Kevin Kelsey is dead. I'm Not literally. Whoa, I'm going to say the, whoa, the whoa, transfer. Whoa. Whoa. Bre- breaking break, news. Breaking news. <laughs> Met- metaphorically. <laughs> the deal is off. Let me phrase it to, that way. He's dead to us. Yes, I okay. uh, I don't think it's Metaphorically. He's not playing for that team. Uh, there has been no other rumors. It was hinted at by Matt Doyle before, but I, I just feel like it already would have happened by now. I, I really think that... I really think that his agent was just trying to force some type of, like, young designated player deal mm. and just maybe didn't appreciate that, like, not only could FC Cincinnati not make him a young designated player, but they could prevent every team in MLS <laughs> from making him a young designated player. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we got a couple weeks. There's still time for that to happen or for something else to happen. But it just it's interesting that it was hot for a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, you had stuff from Bogert and Doyle, which... I'm not sure was Doyle independently knowing anything. It was maybe Doyle hearing the name from Tom Bogert. And then Tom Bogert hearing it from Doyle. And it's like, I'm hearing a lot of chatter about this. (laughs) A lot Um, lot of chatter in the office. Yeah. And then we saw a lot of aggressive chatter from. I would say probably like agent friendly. Sources on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I have a pet theory on this and I want to run it by you guys. And this will, I think, dovetail into our first point that we actually want to make. So this is this is me attempting to do Kevin's job and have a transition right here. Please. I have a thought. What if what Albright is really waiting for on this deal and what was sort of holding it up was waiting for the official confirmation that we will be getting more U22 spots this summer? And that Mm. they like Kelsey, but they don't like him. He's our only U22 signing. We're going to blow the roster spot on just him. And now that we know, based on some of the new reporting that's coming out from the Board of Governors meeting, that we will be getting not one U22 spot, but three U22 spots to fill uh, by the summer window, that maybe it makes things a little less risky to spend on someone like Kelsey if you were like, I like him, but I'm not sure I want to marry my only U22 spot to him. Yeah, I I could see that. The other possibility is, you know, that they they have FCC has the best offer on the table. And until our window is closer, uh, Donetsk is leaving their options open. You know, there's some Scandinavian teams that can still add players. Uh, There's some parts of South America that could still add players. Uh, Kelsey is from Venezuela. So maybe a loan deal back into South America doesn't seem off the table for them or or something along those lines. Um, Feels possible. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense if if you only got one shot, maybe he's not the guy. But if you get three shots, eh, maybe maybe you roll the dice there but no chief you you done did it i think this is a good opportunity to roll right on in to the biggest news and the news i think a lot of people were expecting us to talk about here is that uh we we get it (laughs) 4 a.m this is filed on wednesday by uh paul tenorio at least according to the athletics timestamp here uh saying that mls board of governors has already approved of these rule changes they just need the mlspa to sign off on them uh this is one of those 
uh, little dances MLS has to do where they are allowed to change these rules, but they do need a general okay from the union. Based on what's been discussed, I don't see why the union would disagree with these, but I'm sure there's some points to quibble with or... You know, anytime you you go to something that resembles a negotiation table, they they may be looking to get something back uh, in some way, shape, or form. But in general, here are your uh, your quick rundown. Uh, the easiest one to explain is teams will now get two buyouts per season. Previously, that has been one contract buyout. That is where you pay a player their entire allotment of guaranteed money to then remove them from the team. So it's not a cheap option from the club's ownership perspective, but it immediately moves that player off of the official books. Historically, you can only do that once. Uh, We've done this with players like Fernando Adi and I'm drawing a blank on other people. Oh, Oh, Kenneth Vermeer. Kenneth Vermeer, uh, we've done that with. Usually you do this with vastly... Kyle Makocho too, I think we did it with. Yeah, Makocho mm-hmm. was one of them. Players that are way, way, way underperforming their salary. Not like, ah, that's a disappointment. Like an embarrassingly ga- you know, large gap between performance and pay is when you would pay that out. Uh, giving teams two, uh, it goes to a point that Chief has made over and over again, gives teams the abilities to turn over rosters a little faster and to turn bad teams back into, at the very least, mediocre teams a little quicker. I think this is an easy win for the league. And I think also one of the changes they're making is now you can use these roster buyouts at any time during the season, whereas there was previously a cutoff date, I think, to use the buyout. I think when I think you had to make the roster buyout before the close of this window, I believe, is when it had to be done by. And now they're going to allow you to do it throughout the year and use it twice. I love it. Um, One of the hard things about salary capped leagues. One of the good things about salary cap leagues, I should say, is they promote parity. One of the bad things about salary cap leagues is your team can find itself in cap hell that makes it difficult to compete for multiple terms of years, and that's not fun. The idea of a salary cap should be to make sure that revenue isn't being spent in such a way that one team is able to allocate more resources and basically buy a title. But the idea of salary caps being punitive that they punish you for bad decisions year over years that doesn't really make a league more watchable it's not good for fan engagement um i think that this strikes a pretty good balance in terms of preserving the league's ability to have parity while also making sure the teams don't get stuck mired in mediocrity forever but the other thing too is that like your ownership has to be willing to eat the contract um and that's a big ask I know there's been some debate around, you know, FC Cincinnati circles about comments involving uh, uh, Aaron Bapenza and what we make of his lack of production. There's comments from Taylor Twellman that we talked about on previous shows about how the team might not be thrilled with how the contract is going. That's all well and good. But the idea that you would use a buyout for a player like Aaron Bupenza, Oof. that requires you going to ownership and eating millions and millions of dollars in a league where they just don't generate that kind of revenue like baseball, football, basketball, and other sports. So, you know, that always has seemed like a non-starter with that conversation. And I don't think that the fact that they have two buyouts is going to make ownership any more willing in a lot of places to just eat and turn over contracts. But for teams that are in it and in in dire financial straits, it's a way to avoid going into a death spiral that kills your fan base for multiple years, which is a good thing. I mean, it would be kind of wild to buy out a player with multiple years left on his deal, who's making millions of dollars a year annually, and who you paid a $7 million transfer fee for, that you're now giving up any ability to recoup. Um, (laughs) Now, um, just um, kind of like a little tidbit about this. Kevin mentioned MLS going back to the union on this stuff. So there's like what the union has to agree to is I think kind of it's there's a few different categories of that. So there's things that are in the agree in the agreement that the union would have to agree to change. 
and the buyout is I th- I'm pretty sure in that bucket okay. because the labor agreement between MLS and the Players Association says that there will be one annual buyout that does not hit the um, that does not hit the salary cap. Mm. So for MLS to increase that to two, now we're like we're changing a term in the labor agreement. So this is something that I'm pretty sure the union is going to have to agree to, agree to. That's not true of everything that we are going to be talking about. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that And that's a great point. And because it is such a small point. Yeah. I don't think there will be a, you know, a, a dramatic, long drawn out negotiation. It may very well be the largest holdup is the, you know, the, the functioning of the union, they'll they'll need to get the various reps to sign off on things or whatever. Um, take the, take the temperature of the membership on on something like that. But yeah, pretty straightforward. Nobody is losing money in this case, but it does give ownership a faster <laughs> avenue to making you unemployed. Uh, but you would be made whole as your uh, as your contract. And, and this is there. also this is just codifying what's already happening around the league, and mm-hmm. you've yeah. seen a rise in the mutual termination. Mm-hmm. If you scratch below the surface on that, I guarantee you money's changing hands that we're just not hearing about if the league isn't informed about. There's not that many players that are agreeing to mutually terminate a deal where they're making guaranteed money. So offering the second buyout is just the league deciding to accept what's happening already and say, yeah, you can do this more than once per year. Yeah, yeah that seems there was- right. There was also a situation a couple of years ago, I think we've mentioned this before, Toronto traded a player to Dallas to allow Dallas to then buy out that player because Toronto had already used up their buyout, which is a funny little spot. And I wouldn't be surprised if there is some mechanism for these teams to be able to trade the buyout option around. That could be interesting as well so we we've seen something like that these guys are allowed to be traded especially if they're not dps and don't have various you know no trade clauses so functionally having more buyouts around the league could i would assume increase the number of buyouts generally there um another easy one here but we'll get into the tricky one in a moment uh more gam for transfers, but I'm going to put a little asterisk on this. So they, they do put a cap on the amount of GAM you can get in a uh, certain amount of time for transfers, but generally this should increase the amount of uh, GAM that teams get for transfers. Uh, right now, any transfer, you can convert up to like $1.2 million of that transfer over it, you know, making a profit, a whole bunch of stipulations. But you, in general, you can convert about. I'm not 1. sure you have to make a profit. Oh, okay. So but. you can convert up to about 1.2 million dollars of a transfer into GAM for use elsewhere in your salary. Uh, you know, in, in your in your salary budget. In theory, you could do this with five players. Nobody's ever come close to this, but earn five. You know, point whatever, uh, was six. It, six million dollars. I can I can quick math. All right, <laughs> uh, you can convert about six million of that into gam immediately. Uh, what they're proposing now is that there is a cap per year of three million that you can convert into gam. However, you can earn up to that three million in one single transfer. So, like I said, most MLS teams aren't making multiple multi-million dollar transfers out of the league. So, in a situation like FCC selling Brandon Vasquez to Monterey, instead of just getting $1.2 million in GAM, we could have converted up to $3 million into GAM on that transfer. You'll notice that's more or less three times as much as we were able to originally. That is a huge increase for a team like FC Cincinnati. So this feels like generally a good thing, uh, but you can imagine a scenario where that that actually puts a cap on it. But I don't know, Grayson, positive thing, negative thing? I think it's a positive thing. Uh, The athletic article pointed out that the teams that this would like really help are teams that have like one big sale. Yeah. Versus like Kevin, you mentioned like five smaller sales. So like um uh Chicago uh you know sold John Duran for you know twenty something million dollars. Um they get to convert that into one point two million dollars of GAM. 
Yeah. But if they had sold <laughs> three players for $2 million, right? Right. To, to just kind of simplify it, then they would have gotten $3.6 million in GAM. Right. Um, so I think it, I think it makes sense. I think there's, I think there's some equity to it. Like it just feels like, you know, you shouldn't be essentially penalized. I mean, you get the, I'm not going to cry for Chicago's owner pocketing $20 million, oh, right. but, <laughs> but it, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be like penalized on the roster for having like one big sale versus a couple of relatively inconsequential sales. Um, and, but I think, you know, generally I think just, getting to convert more money from the sales into roster spend is good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mind this, but it seems like, and again, the part of the deal here, I think we, we touched on it earlier, but just to reiterate it, they're obviously making these changes with knowledge that there would be harder and, e and things that are harder and things that are easier to do with the P with the, uh, the, with the players union, the MLSPA. Um, I'm so used to talking about the PSRA. I almost defaulted <laughs> to that as our as our union of choice. I had to check myself right there. But the problem is, is that okay? Is it nice that you get to convert more money into GAM? Yeah, but that doesn't solve. That's not the problem here. The problem is you transfer out. Uh, we'll use Brandon Vasquez as an eight million dollar player, and you can't buy an eight million dollar player back. And yeah. three million in GAM is nice but the way mls computes transfer fees for budget charge which as a reminder that if you bring in an eight million dollar player on a three-year deal you have to split that eight million dollars up over the course of three years on the budget charge and that automatically pushes someone into dp status there's just nothing you're going to be able to do to buy that down with any am gam tam wham bam whatever it is they want to invent there is no mechanism in mls roster rules to buy that down so you're not getting any closer to what i think the solution needs to be and that's it if you sell a brandon vasquez having the ability to buy a brandon vasquez back um yeah so from that standpoint it's kind of like all right but I don't know that this is the, the way forward to try and encourage teams to sell and certainly not the way forward to encourage the development of fan bases to where you have like a situation here in Cincinnati where we're struggling to score goals. We sold off a world class goal scorer. And if you're just a casual fan of this league, you're rightly wondering, well, why couldn't we go buy someone to replace him with all that money we made? Why are we why are we forced to struggle to sell go score goals when we got all this money that should be available to buy a goal scorer back? Um, yeah, that that that's annoying. The other question I have is, did Chris Albright know this was coming? Because <laughs> he has set it up now to where we sold Brandon Vasquez who you know wanted to be sold, and we made our 1.2 million GAM conversion. If we had sold Alvaro, Bar uh, Alvaro Barial this window, we would have made 1.2 million on a GAM conversion. But now by doing a loan, I think it puts us in line to make 3 million in GAM because we'll be selling him after the new rules take over. So instead of making 2.4 million in GAM, we're gonna make 4.2 million in GAM just by the way this was structured. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty clever how that breaks down. I am curious, and Grayson, you you asked this question as well, which is, do we get that gam for, for Brandon Vesca's this season? Like, the sale happened this season. I understand they don't want to retroactively change all of the rules, but that is a pretty significant difference for what ought to be a trophy contending team, a team that was already, you know, I would say almost forced out of the CONCACAF Champions League as a direct result of that sale, both the replacement and where Vasquez ended up. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we have any indication on that one, though. Yeah, I, there's no um, reporting on the timing of when that would apply to. So, like, whether that, um, whether the three million dollar uh, increase, you know, applies to sales that already occurred this calendar year or not. Mm -hmm. So, my assumption is just going to be that it 
it won't until we yeah. find out otherwise. Um, something I want to I want to mention is, um, you know, Chief. Uh, I agree with the point you made about like you can't just go get like a player of you know Brandon Vasquez's quality, right? Because of deep because of the you know max TAM limits and things like that, and because of transfer fees and whatever. But I I do think that you hit on the fact that like it does seem like they looked at they looked for stuff that they could change without like opening up too much bargaining because stuff like how a player's salary budget charge is calculated, which includes the amount of transfer fee that you paid for that player, that is that is written out in detail in the labor agreement. Mm. As far as I know. The amount of GAM that you can convert from an outgoing transfer is just set by MLS. And mm. it's not, and it, that limitation is not written into the, um, is not written into the CBA with the Players Association. So, like, I think it's in the bucket of things that MLS can just do or things that MLS can do with consultation with the players association which kind of more clearly um is something we'll, we'll talk about that um yeah with one of the other with one of the other rule changes yeah i i think that's interesting too the um the the one thing i'd like to just just like a little interesting tidbit with the transfer money and like can convert up to x amount for the the salary i think it always brings to mind so what about the rest of that money like you know what 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 happens to the rest of that eight million dollars uh if memory serves me correct uh there's two points with this one is that teams can convert up to three million dollars a year in gam or 1.2 as it was right, they don't, you don't have to convert have to. They don't have to, right? They can convert none of it if they don't want to. Um, but it's also my understanding that the remainder of that transfer fee, so whatever is not converted into GAM, I think it's only a certain percentage, and there might even be sort of like, you know, different levels or plateaus at certain dollar amounts. That money more or less has to be reinvested in the team somewhere else. It can't necessarily go into the roster, but that's where you'll see teams like uh, Seattle, for example, basically built an entire youth academy on the sale of DeAndre Yedlin originally to Tottenham. Um, so you'll see those the transfer dollars does have to stay somewhere in and around the club. Uh, obviously, a certain percentage of it is going to end up back in the owner's pocket. That's almost the reason why yeah, half these guys are that's here develop, that's <laughs> developing the club it's developing yeah. my interest in spending <laughs> more time investing in my club in the future yeah, but yeah I, I mean it's like trading you can spend that money on trading facilities you can spend it on uh, uh you know your next uh designated player transfer fee or salary you can spend it on like a u22 players yeah. uh transfer fee you could spend uh, it on fc cincinnati paying udf to get branded content and more ice cream flavors with the udf with the fc cincinnati logo <laughs> or maybe maybe taking out some insurance policies at great american insurance to... <laughs> yeah something like that yeah. you know it's you just know some taking the money and then cleaning it through another source to then take it back out at a later date. There's 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 got to be a name for this. I don't know what it's called. Do you think our money owner washing? Has money washing. That's what we money, call it. Money. Yeah, because uh, I think our owner's family at least has access to a like cash heavy business. Yes, cash um, intensive enterprises. Yeah, it's a little easier to sort of like layer in the good money and the um. Let's say yeah. the money you need cleaned. So yeah, yeah, if any of my mock trial students are listening to this podcast, they're fist pumping like nobody's business right now because that was the Ohio mock trial problem this year. Was, oh, a, was it? Was money laundering through a cash intensive enterprise? So, the, so I'm looking at the 2024 roster rules, and it looks like there's not really a requirement that you spe that you reinvest that money. Oh, good. I mean, as okay, a practical good. as a practical matter, they do, but it talks about how like. You know, it talks about the GAM conversions. And then the, the last paragraph is just the remaining balance of the club share, if any, and which cannot be traded, will be distributed by the league to the club as cash. 
Oh, okay. I hope, it, I hope it actually is cash. I hope, I hope it's, it's a, brie- a briefcase. <laughs> cash or cash equivalents. So yeah. like bearer bonds. <laughs> Bit- Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> bearer bonds that's always good uh <laughs> so bearer bonds they, are just one of those things where it's like you just you feel wealthier if you're walking around with bearer bonds well, so they talk about isn't aren't like traveler's checks just bearer bonds oh this is yes. gonna take me back to secured transactions they are they're what are they they're they're uh negotiable instruments they are it's com- it's a commercial paper it's a payable on demand to the bearer so yeah i guess they would technically be a bearer bond then yeah that's like the fun part where you learn that you can take a personal check for people that still write those and it's made out to kevin wallace and then you can sign your name on the back of the check and then just add two you know grace and chalmers and then all of a sudden he becomes the person who is the payee on the check and then he could sign to someone else's name and you could get it really going on the back of a check to the point where you need like a magnifying glass and a separate piece of paper to determine who this check has gone to <laughs> it's, i like the idea it feels that way with like digital currency where it's just like we're all just passing ones and zeros around to each other that yeah we should all just like keep a ledger on the back of somebody's personal check and so long as nobody bothers to cash it we're all and even we, i don't understand why the bank just can't make the number on the screen bigger right who's that hurting <laughs> <laughs> it's not real money anyway it's all fake. they don't have that much money no imagine if fifth third just added a zero to everybody's bank account just one zero <laughs> delete you, you, all the backups there's yeah, no way you, to go back if you <laughs> add cool, the zero man. to my bank account i promise i won't take all that out i just want to be able to show people i have that balance and then you, use that for loans and leverage transactions elsewhere in order to make more money I just want to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, Just make the number bigger. I'm not going to. They could just. You know what they should have is they should have a vault at the bank. Okay. Just like Scrooge McDuck coins. (laughs) And people just get to sign up and just get to be like, oh, yeah, this is my money. I get to swim in it. That would hurt, right? Like, it can't be enjoyable. (laughs) Maybe if you're like a duck and you've got kind of like a different, like, kind of physiology, but like, I would not enjoy it. No. So like diving that, into does, it. Jesus. Does that mean that in the DuckTales universe, the ducks float on metal? Yes. Or their currency is actually like chocolate coins wrapped in foil. So or their yeah. coins are actually, they exist in a solid and liquid state at the same time. <laughs> it's like some new form of matter. Like, you know how like, what do they call that non-Newtonian fluid where yes. if you hit it really hard it's solid but if you pass through slowly <laughs> it you can put your hand into it much like the shield the slow in blade the slow penetrates blade the shield, penetrates the shield. <laughs> so maybe the money in the ducktales universe is yes. the inverse newtonian fluid where it is solid if you move slowly on it but if you're moving quickly it becomes more of a liquid state that you can swim through so you take like one this. step onto it it'll be solid you jump into it, it changes form in order to allow you to swim. Wow. I like this. I think we cracked the code. <laughs> I, I, it's a universe where Gizmo Duck can exist, so anything appears possible. The Somehow. Man, the man is a superhero on a unicycle. I don't know how that <laughs> works either. Somehow this makes more sense than the MLS rules. So. I mean, it's, it, it's a universe where nobody wears pants. So let's let's be real about what we're really dealing with here. You want to know something funny? Uh, I'd be shocked if anybody, anybody has heard of this TV show. But uh, my kids have gotten obsessed, uh, thanks to uh, Disney Plus, with the show Quack Attack. I don't know if anybody remembers Quack Attack. This is Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Uh, it came out in 1996. There were only 30 episodes. Huey, Dewey, and Louie are teenagers, and it is the most 90s cartoon ever. They've got bad attitudes. They've got a famous uncle. It's weird. But man, I didn't like the Rugrats all grown up. No, that was like, trash. Like, I, I like them as I want you guys just to be babies. Yeah. I don't care what, what you are as adults <laughs> not um, that invested in you <laughs> although i do think i do think chief the the you mentioned like a universe where nobody wears pants i do wonder if that's why like in a post me too environment we have not heard much from scrooge mcduck lately right. <laughs> <laughs> i don't need more duck tales i need more dark wing duck that was mm. that was my jam that was the superior show i think Darkwing, Darkwing would be a funny one for like a gritty reboot. 
<laughs> it, would just, it would just be called Darkwing. Yeah, yeah, it would. Honestly, be- Netflix would be all over this. This doesn't feel like Disney's move. Netflix would do some like bloody, gruesome Darkwing series. I because uh, because it's not enough to make like, uh, like you know, entertainment for adults, right? Because adults are babies now, so you have to make the cartoons that they like, but adult. give them like an adult veneer. <laughs> Sabrina the Teenage Witch all over again. So like they still watch we're still watching cartoons. Yeah, we're still watching we're still watching X-Men, quite literally the same show I was watching in 1997. They're even telling me in the title it's X-Men from 97. I don't care. I have no shame. Just bring Darkwing <laughs> Duck back. I want to hear more I am the terror that flaps in the night. That's all I'm looking for. If I see like one more video of Steve from Blue's Clues. Oh my god. Like reassuring millennials that like there's not a monster under the bed. <laughs> who who needs that video? I understand like it the might ATF be... is going to have to like <laughs> have a meeting with me. <laughs> oh man. Uh well, finally there is one third <laughs> rule. I'm just moving on. We're just plowing ahead after that. Um, everything Grayson just said was parody, by the way. Uh, the, the third and final rule here, uh, was the trickiest one to explain. Um, so I'll do my best to explain the rule as it is now, and then what it will look like under the new rule. Uh, the rule as it stands now, teams can have three designated players. We all know this. These are players that can be paid an unlimited amount of money, both in transfer fee and salary. However, If they have three, I'll say expensive designated players, they are allowed to have one U22 player. This is a player that expensive and old, expensive and old. So three Lucille Bluths. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And so long as you have all three of those, you get one U22 player, which is a player that is generally under the age of 22. Uh, You can pay an unlimited transfer fee for them so long as they make less than the maximum salary uh, charge. They get charged to the salary a little bit less, but generally that's the rule. Uh, Players like this for us in the past have been Alvaro Barriel, Marco Angulo, as being FC Cincinnati. Uh, however, if you have just two designated players or two three, Lucille Bluths through two Lucille Bluths <laughs> or three designated players, but one of them is relatively cheap or young. So like an other Lucille or a maybe. Yes, a maybe. Um, if you have that situation, so two expensives or three, but one of them's not quite the is is expensive or older the other ones, then you can get three U22 players. That is the current rule. OK, so under the new rules, there is a sort of choose your own adventure option here. And this is funny because I feel like we suggested this like six months ago, but the uh, the the new rule is that if you have three expensive and old DPS, that you will be allowed to have three U twenty two players. You don't need to do the weird thing with the age or the expensiveness on the third one. That's great. Or if you'd like, you can have just two designated players and get four U twenty two players and two million dollars extra in GAM. Now again, GAM can basically be used anywhere on transfers or paying down a player's budget charge. This is a lot of flexibility. It allows teams to go, say, superstar heavy, a la Miami, or it allows teams like, say, Philadelphia or Dallas to go a little leaner and focus more on the youth players. This is interesting, and I will say, I really like this. I don't know, Chief... How do you feel about choose your own adventure books being added to the uh, the rule book? Honestly, I've been sitting here for the last few minutes trying to figure out if we actually know who Huey, Dewey, and Louie's parents are because it's mm, we Uncle, don't. It's Uncle Donald, but Scrooge is their grandfather. It was the nineties. People didn't ask questions about weird old men hanging out with kids. Yeah, it's a different time, <laughs> particularly um, around animation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mister Wizard would be problematic nowadays. Um, 
Okay, so on this idea of choose your own adventure, I like anything that gives you different opportunities to choose how you want to develop your squad your own way. I like anything that pushes us away from homogenization of style of play, of roster build, away from the idea of, you know, meta or min-maxing how you build a roster out. This isn't a Call of Duty loadout. There shouldn't be just one way that is the best or most optimum way to build a roster. What I question is that like you almost have to crunch the numbers on this to a certain extent but it feels like if you're going to do this that the value add of choosing to go with one less designated player and one extra u22 there should be more gam i feel that go along with that than two Mm. million you know i would think that maybe the answer is that the amount of gam you get is some mathematical formula of the average salary over max budget charge of all of the other three third designated players in the league or something that more reflects how much money other teams are spending on their third designated player that you get to choose to use that in GAM as long as you're keeping the rest of your players under that max budget charge. So that's really that's a, that's a math and a rounding issue for me in a number issue, but otherwise I like it. And the reason why I think it's a good thing is that when they said this, I didn't have an immediate reaction as to which one was better and that I could Mm. see myself being talked into the fourth U22 plus 2 million extra in GAM to make your roster better across the table. Because what you're really talking about is you're really talking about being able to add for the most part two additional max tam players with that extra two million dollars in gam and that's that's not nothing that's two would you rather have one designated player or two miles robinsons and i don't know what the right answer is there yeah i think that's super interesting grayson let me ask you this for fc cincinnati I don't I don't know how these rules assuming they get implemented. I don't know how this mechanism would work and I'm, I'm, maybe you can shed some light here. Could could we propose FC Cincinnati go for the 2 DPs for U22s and 2 million in gam but immediately use that gam to pay down OB to not be a DP not this year. Not this year. That's not enough to buy no, it down. Because Obi's okay. Obi's transfer because of the size of Obi's transfer fee, mm-hmm. um, which comes off after it, this year. It comes off after this year. They don't have to okay. account for his transfer fee on the budget after this year. Okay. But because of the size of Obi's transfer fee, he has to be a designated player this year. Okay. Next year is an option year. Um, he will not have to be a designated player based on his salary. So you could buy him down and go down to two designated players, Lucho and Bupenza. And then you have a choice, right? You can sign of four U22s, take the $2 million in GAM, and sign another OB and another Miazga or something. Or you can sign a, sign a third designated player uh, instead. And I think that's basically the decision that FC Cincinnati will will face next year. Um, potentially, I mean, maybe this year. We don't know what's going to happen with the roster in the summer. Maybe somebody comes in with a lot of money and they just want to buy Obi. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm curious to see how this rule plays out in practice. Um, something I found interesting was. Only four. So FC Cincinnati went the route of having three expensive and old designated players. Yes. So they only had one U22 slot coming into this year, which was occupied by Marco Angulo until he was loaned out. Only four teams in the league went that route. Every other team in the league had their roster uh, built in such a way where they could have the maximum of three U22 players. Um, I don't know, you know, what that really... I don't don't think there's, like, a takeaway from that. I mean, like, the teams that had... uh, that went with three 
old and expensive designated players were all like I think pretty good teams. I know Nashville was on the list. I yeah, don't I have remember. it. You Nashville, have it. New England, Orlando, and us. So all yeah, teams, so all teams that were really good last year, and all teams I would say are in win now mode. These yeah. are teams trying to win a trophy this year. Yeah. So, um, I'm curious to see what decisions teams make moving forward because, like, it's not like that extra U22 slot. Those players are those players are crapshoots. Yeah. yeah, they've been for everybody. Nobody has hit crap Nobody has hit on all of their U22 players, but being able to have four, I guess it does increase the chances that one of them, one but of them like, hits. I, I think there's a bigger difference, though, between having... So, like, I agree with the idea that, like, you know, U22 players, we said it on here a lot, that they're, they're lottery tickets. So the idea with lottery tickets is you got to buy a, a bunch of lottery tickets to expect one of them to pay out. So, on one hand, having three U22 spots versus one... It increases, it triples the odds, basically, that you're going to find a U22 player that pans out as a really good player that you can get quality minutes out of and maybe sell for a profit. So I get the idea of having one U22 puts a lot of pressure on the U22 spot to perform. Having three, you have more odds. But does having four versus three really change the math that much? I don't know. You're going from tripling your odds of success to increasing it by 33%. It doesn't, the math doesn't add up there. I understand why you would want to have the three versus the one, but four versus three, that doesn't, that doesn't make it move for me. Well, but I think, I think that, I think that's why you have to also add in the increase in GAM. Right. Um, I'm, I'm agnostic on whether $2 million is the right number. Yeah. But I think we'll I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see some experimentation on this, right? It, and we'll see how we'll see how teams use the money. We'll see how teams use the roster slots. Um, I know that a lot of people are complaining that it feels like they're just making the roster rules more complicated, but that that's just going to be how how they change things yeah. for for the immediate next couple of years, at least. Um, it's going to be from tweaks to roster mechanisms. It's not going to be. We're scrapping all the roster mechanisms and every team has a $50 million salary cap and transfer fees don't count. Like it's right. not going to be anything like really nuts like that. So um, I think that these rules are, we complained before the season that the roster rules they changed were insignificant. God, these I don't are, even remember what they these, did change. <laughs> they just, they just they made, made it so that if you're, you're de- they made it so that if the DP was making less than the That's max TAM threshold that you could, <laughs> have <laughs> you could get some gam for the gam, sale yeah it was a carve out um, explicitly for miami yeah <laughs> yeah and then they changed like that if a player a player now got to the second window to get a green card which is what the rule used to be yeah um whatever but like these are however you feel about them you can't deny that these are significant changes to to significantly increase the amount of money that MLS teams can spend in their rosters. Yeah. You can quibble, you, you know, you can quibble about like exactly how that spending is used. You can question how teams are going to do it. Um, but I don't think anybody can really know those answers until we see it in practice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. Again, the U 22s you can spend an unlimited amount of money on the transfer fee and presumably the teams that were, you know, locking up expensive DPs or were willing to spend that money were being then locked out of those extra U 22 spots. Now that that's open, it ought to increase overall spending. Uh, also just as a point, I, I do find it interesting. The same people who are clamoring for, you know, abolishing all of the various uh, salary rules uh, are a lot of the same people who have been uh, clamoring for respecting uh, organized labor. Keep in mind, a lot of these rules are in place to protect the MLSPA. Sure, they they help the owners ultimately not spend money, but they also preserve guys, you know, like Nick Hagland getting a job in this league, the the sort of lunch pail, dare I say, blue collar workers of the union uh, that make up the majority of this league. That's why a lot of these exist. And yeah, it sounds great to scrap the salary cap and or, you know, make it $50 million or whatever, but you won't get the union to sign off on that. So no. 
know. To be clear, yeah, that is an so, anti-union take. And it's also in in the CBA. It does say that MLS can increase the they call them youth player slots in the CBA, but that's the U twenty two slot. Mm-hmm. It says they can increase them after consultation with the union. Union doesn't have to in- agree to increase them. There are like kind of some strings that aren't worth going into that would accompany with the increase. But like, again, like this is stuff that MLS by and large can do either just by like notifying the union or by just exercising its discretion or in the case of the second buyout, something they probably feel they can do. They can get the union to just agree on. They can't scrap all of this without tearing up the entire CBA, which if you recall, (laughs) <laughs> um, was renegotiated ahead of 2020 and then negotiated again in 2021 because yeah. the union was required to make all types of concessions in 2020. And the league said, well, we took a big financial hit in 2020 and it was like kind of contentious. And there was some thought for a little bit that maybe there wouldn't, that there would be like a delay to the start of the MLS season. Um, yeah. And, um, and so, like, this is there's like a lot of history behind this current contract, which is written to go to 2028. Yeah. And part of the contract also includes things that the union bargained for that is meant to make up for some of the concessions and, and salary cuts players made in 2020. And it is just it's a long document, a yeah. lot of words in it, a lot of work and history went into went into negotiating it. And so like, yeah, I mean, I think on the one hand, it's like, it makes sense for fans and people not familiar with the league to complain about, you know, some of the complication of the roster rules. I think it's a little silly for like league journalists to do it because they should know better. Yeah. About how complicated the process and the relationships are that went into putting all of it together. Yeah. yeah. Real quick, Chief. Um, I do want to ask Grayson real quick. U22, is there anything keeping them from just increasing that age? Like, I feel like that spot yeah, changes that, quite that a bit. that is in there. So Okay, okay. Um, there is a... A uh, U25 point, it, it says, spot so, is a very different equation. <laughs> so the youth player slot, it says the player must be 22 years or younger in the year he is eligible to play in an MLS game. Okay. So, like, MLS can't just make it a U25. Okay. Okay. I was curious about that point. Yeah. Sorry, Chief. I I cut you off there. The bottom line on all this, if you're looking for a takeaway, is that if they were going to make roster changes and roster rule changes, this is one of the very few specific ways they could do something that directly benefits FC Cincinnati as one of the only teams, as Grayson brought up, one of the only four teams that is using all three of our designated player spots as non-young designated players. Um, there's only four teams that benefit from now being able to go from two one U22 to three U22s. We have added two more bullets in the chamber for Albright to go out and spend a transfer fee on. And like we've said, or like I said earlier, it now increases the likelihood that one of those signings, if we fill all three, and I... I hope we fill all three between this window and the summer window because we need to increase the odds that one of these players pans out and can give minutes to this team. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, why not? You know, this does give you the opportunity to bring in a guy that you maybe don't expect to push for the first team immediately, right? Like you can you can build some depth, you can bring in some longer term plays with this, and yeah, you you hope they pan out uh, a little bit more there. Um, so yeah, quite a bit. I will say, and I will actually link it this time. Uh, Grayson wrote a fantastic article. Uh, I'd say not too long ago. It was like the third most recent article. It was like eight months ago or whatever, but it was the, uh, a great article explaining some of the basics of the MLS roster rules, the difference between GAM and TAM and budget charges. It's really, really good. So I will link it in the description of this. So if you do need to get a little more familiar with the um 
the nuts and bolts of this, or not even the nuts and bolts, but the, the basic building blocks of the roster uh, and its mechanisms, go check that out. That is super, super useful. Um, but in the meantime, while you are, uh, say, bookmarking that, but still listening, okay, uh, we're going to head on over to part two, where we are joined by... Tyler Snipes. Tyler is a great writer. He's been covering FC Cincinnati and MLS for quite some time now. And we talk about it. He is overdue to be on the postcast. And we had a fantastic conversation with him about covering FC Cincinnati. In particular, an article many of you probably read about Frankie Amaya that went up on the league's website uh, not too long ago. It's a really, really fun conversation. We cover quite a few topics. A lot of FCC2 talk towards the end of that. So if you're curious, about that team. Should you be mad at that team? You get to find out uh, in this conversation. Uh, on the back end, uh, we will catch you and talk briefly about Montreal and we'll wrap up the show. And before we get into the next part of the episode, I want to tell you about our other sponsor, Cincy Shirts. And if you're going to sit here and tell me that you've never heard of Cincy Shirts, I'm going to sit here and tell you, I don't believe you. Because these guys have been with FC Cincinnati from the very beginning. And we here at The Post, well, we are just huge, huge fans of their work. They have tons of really cool FC Cincinnati gear, shirts, hoodies, hats, all sorts of cool stuff. Go over to their website, check out what they are selling. You want to go to cincyshirts.com. That is Cincy with a Y, or you can just click the link in the description of this episode. And when you go there, use the promo code the post Cincy, all one word, all caps, and they will knock 10% off your next order. They have MLS and MLSPA licensed FCC gear available online or in their three retail locations in Hyde Park, Fort Mitchell, or Loveland. And I can attest to this. I've used this before. If they don't have your size on the shelf, they can probably print you one on the spot in the store. So again, huge thank you to Cincy Shirts for sponsoring the postcast and a huge thank you to you, dear listener, for using that promo code. And joining us here in part two, a very special guest for us here on the postcast. We are joined by MLS soccer writer Tyler Snipes. Tyler, how are you doing tonight, man? I couldn't be better. I'm uh, so happy that I'm finally on the postcast. I don't know how <laughs> many people have completed the trifecta of like CST, Queen City Press, and the Postcast, but I have been waiting for this invitation for such a long time. <laughs> I'm so happy that today's it's like, it's like the lamest EGOT that you can possibly pick up. <laughs> <laughs> I take a lot of pride in it, so I, I appreciate you boys having me, and it's great to see you guys. Oh, no, we're so happy to have you here. And yeah, as you said, this is long overdue. We've we've done a pretty good job, I think, of trying to get as many voices as we can in and around FC Cincinnati on the pod. Uh, but you're one that escaped us. So we're, we're glad to rectify that. Um, I guess that's that's kind of where I want to start. So I know I know some about you. I don't know a lot about you. Uh, this is what I know. And then I want you to fill in some blanks here. I believe you're based here in Cincinnati and I believe you used to cover FC Cincinnati for SBI. How far off the mark am I? <laughs> no, that's, that's both true. Um, yeah. And like and I know like I probably like I got started with SBI as a little bit of like an S or an FC Cincinnati specialist. Um, mm. So, you know, I mean, I used to be a little bit more visible. Um, Kevin, I know that you and I have had to see eye to eye, you know, come to like, <laughs> <I'd scream out. laughs> yes. I, I used to just be such a shithead. And like, um, there was like a period where like, you know, like, the fan run outlets were like just consistently breaking the news like of the team. And, like I was so jealous of that. Just like getting started, like trying to get like a foothold, you know what I mean? And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I've learned to chill out. I've learned to like, not <laughs> up on. I've learned to just like focus on myself. And um, so, yeah, I got started with SBI, um, you know, moved around a little bit the last couple of years. I've worked for MLS next pro. Now I'm working for MLS soccer. Um, it's easily misunderstood. Like I'm not a reporter. I'm not a journalist. I just, I, I just do 
league shill content in a very <laughs> manner. Sometimes I'm shooting videos, sometimes I'm writing articles, sometimes I'm there's just a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm just somebody who's working to um find that dream job one day and just spend my days doing this full time and and whatever whatever I can do to put myself in that position. That's what I do now. Um, so yeah, I'm state run media, which I know is everybody on here. <laughs> um, but, uh, just so are we. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, for, so like, you know, just for anybody listening, you're just like, Oh, I remember that guy from back in the day. Where did he go? That that's what it was. It was just like, I mean, I like this town did not need me trying to be a beat writer. And it was an unbelievably frustrating thing for me to try and do. And I don't do it anymore. Um. <laughs> well, you know, in some small way, I'm glad we could help break your spirit so that you could eventually get a job with MLS, you know, <laughs> whatever it took. It there. did all work out in a weird way. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it's very funny because in my mind, the post was always supposed to be opinion you know we, we've talked we, we've talked plenty on this podcast about the uh the difference between the uh the, sort of the columnist and the reporter which is like an absolutely blurred line these days and it's not even clear that these are distinctions anymore in media it feels like um and yet we always seem to have been especially in the the night camp years breaking hard news and we occasionally do that as as well and it was never the point and i don't know how we really ended up there it's it's a very weird evolution for us as well and i i'll be honest too i'm kind of glad we're we're a little bit further away from it it's more fun to take shots from outside than, than being inside and it's also like um when you're like sourcing, you're just bothering people a lot. Yeah. You know yes. I mean? like it's, it's like you're just taking from people constantly. It's like you broke the news that they are signing this player. You get all the credit, but it's not like you fucking signed the player. You know what I mean? Right. It's, right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just like after a while, you know what I mean? It's like the late nights, the bothering people, the, all that. Like it, you know, it, it's for certain people. It's an imp it's important work to be done. But like, man, if you don't have to do it, don't. Like, you know, it's for anybody who's like curious about that side of the business. It is, it's a grind and it's not not the most enjoyable, but it is glamorous. You know what I mean? Like Tom Boomer, like kind of emerging as like the MLS Adam Schefter, you know what I mean? I think it needs that. And I do think that like mm -hmm. people who are very good at it, but it's not for the amateurs, man. It is, it is brutal. Well, the problem, <laughs> the reason why it's not for the amateurs, which is goes to your point is that the reason why Adam Schefter or Woj or Tom Bogart are successful at what they do is they have vast networks of sources to where they're never bothering the same person two days in a row. So that part of your brain that is like, God, I keep texting this person. They're going to get sick of me. I'm going to get blocked. I'm going to get cut off. You never have that happen because you can always say, oh, well, I haven't hit this person or this agent or this GM up lately. When you're trying to get into the breaking news game and you've got one contact somewhere, <laughs> it gets awkward real quick. <laughs> yeah. And if you like have anxiety, it's super fun. Like those hours, you know, they go by so, so slow. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and especially when it's a race, when you're racing Tom Bogert, right? It's like, all right, I'm I'm vastly outgunned here. So if this doesn't happen in five minutes, I I quit. Yeah. <laughs> I I'm curious, SBI. So if if I am not mistaken, SBI stands for Soccer by Ives. Um, d what is this outlet? Because if I memory serves correctly, uh, the I in SBI went and reclaimed his outlet. What happened here? What, what was this? Yeah. Um, so not, not to be that guy, um, uh, but it's just <laughs> like, I'm not going to go on the record. Not, not saying it right. It, it's Ivis is what he, Ivis. Oh, Ivis. excuse okay. me. Excuse yeah. me. Okay. Ivis Galarsep. Um, so back in like the MLS 1.0, 2.0 days, like he he covered soccer far before it was cool. And like he was like up there with like the Grant Walls and like the Jeff Carlisles and the Stephen Goffs of just like people really covering the league in a way that gave it dignity. Um, and then like throughout the years, it's just taken on many forms. Like it just used to be Ivis's personal blog. And then it evolved to a point where he could hire people. And then like it was really in a heyday. I joined like late in 2018, just off of an email and then just just looking for a place to be you know what i mean and yeah. um then like just kind of like in getting to work with him like what i will say is like he's the best mentor in the business like any young mm. writer could ever ask for 
um and like you know like you you look through like just like the people under his tree it's like you'll see like sam stage school pablo mar like those kind of people it's you know he's a really mm. really good place to start your career and then to your point kevin it's just taken on many forms like sometimes there's been a staff of 15 people and they're able to cover the league crazy sometimes like right now i think there's only a staff of like three people so like u.s soccer particularly men's national team is going to be their focus just because that's really um you, as you guys know like it's it's hard to sling articles it's hard to make money off of articles and that's you know the space where they have like the most equity um so it's um you know all that said it's you know it's not it's not it's not going to pay your bills it is a place where you get your name out there it is a place where if you're a young writer and you know you need to be able to get into games and you need to just be able to grow your career in that way and like learn from really smart people. That's, that's what it is. And then that's also why it's kind of like a rotating door because Ivis mm. the goat, you know, he's graduated on and like, he's had like, you know, other big jobs in the past. Like he's worked for like ESPN goal, whatever. Now he's working for CBS and he's like really high up, like in the broadcast side. So, you know, he, he only has like so much time for it, but then like the managing editor, Larry, he's one of my best friends in the entire world. Um, and they, they just kind of, it's just like, who's willing to help keep that site running. And that's kind of what it is. And then like the volume you see from it just largely depends on that because you cannot cover 29 fucking MLS teams. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess to back up here a little bit, just in case people aren't as familiar with you. So how did you get your start into writing about soccer? What was it that drew you to being a soccer writer and wanting to do this for a living? I've always just loved sports and I've always kind of like been like on the creative side. Like when I was younger, I was in like bands and I'm a college dropout because I wanted to be in a band that, you know, started like leaving town a lot. Um, so I've always been like following that non-conventional career path and like whatever, whatever it is. And like, meanwhile, this whole time I've been doing like boring email day job work. So like, I know what I don't want to do for a living, you know, like I've got to like maintain that but i've always just like loved being around games and then when like the 2010 world cup that was definitely my starting point as a soccer fan and then the uh 2016 crystal palace friendly is like when it it just became so clear to me like, there's opportunity here in this city as this team grows you know like the mls rumbling start to start like everything it's like hey like you can really apply yourself and maybe turn this into something because you know like the bengals the reds even like our college institutions like the door just isn't as wide open to like do something here. And I, you know, grew in love with soccer. I, I'm, I'm not the most educated, like MLS 1.0 era, but I do, you know, have enough influence and I know the places to look. And I probably know more than I'm giving myself credit for at this point. But yeah, I mean, this team, you know, FC Cincinnati, just as much as it did for for everybody, it just changed my life. It gave me kind of like a new way to, you know, pursue like that dream job and do something that I really love for a living. And that's being at games and telling people about them in one way or another. And um, yeah, I, I just, I got really lucky when Ivis answered my email and gave me a shot and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Man, <laughs> that's, I, I think in a lot of ways we have, we all have a similar-ish story where FCC finally enabled us to have a, a local outlet for that, right? Like it, the Saints existed. And yeah, I mean, I went to games. I, I went to, uh, what were they, uh, Riverhawk games before. But yeah, there was something about FCC that, yeah, I think everybody sort of recognized was different and, and was going to pull a different weight. Um, Billionaire owner. Yeah, yeah, you know, when yeah. Carl Linder drops a <laughs> professional team in Nippert Stadium, you, know, you, you notice that, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> Raises an eyebrow at the very least. <laughs> Somebody's trying, all right? Um, <laughs> so it's interesting to me, something that you mentioned just a second ago. So you, your passion is is inflamed, we'll say, by the, the start of FC Cincinnati. You talked about telling stories and wanting to tell stories about the game. And you also mentioned when you were talking about working with SBI, uh, with Ivis, about the idea of its written content and written content can only get you so far in terms of the ability to monetize it and the page clicks. When you talk about telling stories, how do you like to tell stories? Are you more someone that wants to write? Do you want to do video content? Do you want to be creative? What is your, in your mind, is the best way to tell the story of soccer for Tyler? Um, I mean, for me, like what I like to do the most is just like write long articles that are punishing to read and go into way too much detail. <laughs> That's not where people are at right now. You know what I mean? Like 
Um, what we've learned over the years is that it's just a mobile heavy audience. And like, it just depends. You know, like, you guys might be hardcore. Like I like to read books still, for example, I like to read <laughs> on the desktop. I like to listen to instrumental music and like just read with a full experience. And I do a lot better with that when I'm on my phone, I'm just too easily distracted, but that's not most people. Most people don't want to read 2000 words about something. So uh, to answer your question, it's like, I just want to meet people where they're at. And right now that's definitely going towards the video side. And it makes a lot of sense because, um, you can spend 10 minutes reading something that you can watch in two minutes and get all the information. You can see people's face move around. You can see them not like a question. You know what I mean? Like you can see like enthusiasm a bit more and that's becoming a lot more efficient. Um, I wish I, you know, was like, <laughs> like, I'm just trying to think of like a, like, I'm just too ugly to be even done video. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> nobody wants to see me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we have, like, plenty of, like, beautiful people who are trained for this and have spent their whole life to be in front of camera. I, Those are the people, you know, the sun's shining for them right now a lot more than the writer. <laughs> but as you guys know, this whole thing is cyclical. You know what I mean? What's old is new. And, like, writing will find its place. But right now at the moment, and, like, you know, with, with where I work, you know, the focus is very much on being brief letting the moment speak for itself, letting the quote speak to it, you know, for itself, because people don't really care for the details. Like when it comes like a mass audience, you know what I mean? So, um, well, to answer your question, like, you mean, like, I, I told you what I like to do, but like, I also like to do what people enjoy. I like to do like what will have the most impact. And a lot of times that for me is just getting out of the way and putting the players in place to, you know, really just ha like, let the story breathe and, it, that oftentimes doesn't involve me having a ton of fingerprints on it. You know, I'm just the one pressing buttons sometimes. As someone else with a face for radio, I completely understand. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like the opening there, not to not to step on old Dos, Dos Harks' uh, toes here. MLS original music. Come on, you were in a band? I feel like this is an untapped medium for you. You got Apple Music right there. Like, there's some brand synergy that can be happening with this. <laughs> Dude, my band, like, so like, we... Like back when like people bought CDs, right? Like, you know, and you were buying <laughs> EP. I don't know if like if anybody's like in like the local music scene at all. Like we used to record like Moonlight Studios and like it, there was like a scene, you know, like the Mad Hatter shows and like opening for big bands. Some of them would take you, you know, out of town a little bit and all that. We existed like right at the end of CDs. And then like when like MySpace and Facebook existed, but like that's iTunes existed, but like Apple Music is not iTunes. So, like none of that legacy is there. And then Spotify did not exist. Mm -hmm. So like our whole cool moment, or like if I wanted to like re, you know, push it back out there, like remind people of like what it was, it's like it just looks so shitty on Spotify because like nobody <laughs> ever used it. All the songs are under, you know what I mean, like a thousand plays. And like I, there's photos of us, you know, you know, ripping it live and everything, but like it just it yeah, we we missed the mark. Like we were truly one of those like wrong generation, not in terms of making it, but in terms of like just like having any sort of like I can prove it to you. This band used to mean something, you know, right. I just can't prove it to you. Like, do you have any, we, we, do you were, have any we were top, top eight for yes. somebody. <laughs> what, band, what band were you guys in? No, no, oh, no, no, no. I'm no. just saying like, you're bragging. It's like, oh, you don't understand. In my day, it wasn't how many streams you got. It was how many top eights you were in the top eight. Of. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, my man. space still looks good. Like I'll, I'll like check it every now and then just to like, see like if the files on it still work and some of them do. And it's just like, Hell yeah, that's there. But how long? How long is that server going to be there? Like that's going to be toast any day now. I don't. Know. I think I, you should send Kevin a link to the MySpace. We'll put it in the show notes. People can go visit it for themselves. Get some more plays. Or, yeah, if you want to hear what you know, <laughs> some nineteen-year-old pop punk love songs about girls, I've got you covered. I can think of nothing else that the postcast is for than exactly <laughs> pop punk songs about girls. Absolutely. So <laughs> I actually I had this really weird idea that I was going to start uh, the first soccer supporters group that only had a MySpace page instead of a website. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> like trying to sign up for a MySpace in 2017 or 2018. It was a shockingly difficult thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> that would be huge, man. <laughs> We're cornering this one very specific part of the market because I like to imagine. Yeah. There's probably 15 or 20 people out there that are just still on MySpace. They never migrated to Facebook. They never migrated to Twitter or X or whatever. And they're just really confused as to why no one's commenting on their wall anymore. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did like when it rebooted. God, I know we're going down a weird cul de sac this here. This is like, great. Welcome uh, to the post. When it rebooted. Do you remember that? Like it like re- Justin Timberlake oh. bought it and and kickstarted it again. Yeah. I was like enthusiastic because like Facebook was kind of like ruined by like our older generation at that point. It was just like, oh shit, like I could. I, all right, I'm back. And it, <laughs> like, two seconds. See, I think it would be really funny if it turned out that all of MySpace was perfectly preserved somewhere. It went away for 20 years and then came back and said, you can log back into your old MySpace. And then we were all forced to confront, you know, our pages that had animated images and crazy towns, butterflies playing on loop in the background. Your layout, your all of our angsty layout. blog posts from college are still up there. <laughs> Oof. Uh, the, the I don't want to see that actually. Now that yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, well, speaking of angsty teenagers, this is going to be my segue. Um, <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, that was almost a spit take right there. I like that. <laughs> People will never get to appreciate what that was on video there. Uh, I mean, obviously, Tyler, you've been somebody we've we've wanted to have on the show, and I could think of no better excuse than the article you wrote about Frankie and I and the the New York Red Bulls generally uh, taking the uh, the lead in the supporters' shield. Um, I have to admit, very self-indulgent. I couldn't help but notice in the uh, tweet you originally sent out, uh, you had mentioned that Frankie and I had seen the clock, and (laughs) the clock lives on the post, so... Can you confirm that Frankie and Maya is aware of the time since Frankie has not thanked the fans clock? I can confirm. Um, and this is like, <laughs> like any good Alan Koch tethered story. I'm going to set the scene for you guys here. And I Please. want you to not get too high with the highs or too low with the lows. Okay. okay. Nobody thought that, did they? <laughs> That I was, blocked that entire uh, portion of my memory out. <laughs> I just I just remember watching a terrible game against San Jose, hoping that that was going to be the end of it. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, you transported me back in time. <laughs> yeah. um, so obviously that game happens. Um, we're all aware of that. And Frankie becomes a big part of it. And it's just like, OK, cool. Like, here's an opportunity to just dive into this. You know I mean? I don't know how long it's been. And obviously something where I'm going to have some questions for you guys on the other side of this. Um, It felt like, you know, just particularly, particularly against him tonight. Like, you know, not that anybody's, he's not been Cincinnati sweetheart since 2021, but it's, it was very much like up a notch um, in compared, you know, to things that I, and you know, other people um, around me, you know, could recall. Um, So like, while we're waiting for him, um the you know like i'm just sitting there with like the comms people like for red bulls and they're just like yeah like you know because I mean, cincinnati just like like that with like every you know like all of their like former players like you know like, it just like what was going on there and i'm just like oh no like you guys don't know like anything about this dude and like no 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 i'm like okay like they, they have a whole clock um like there's <laughs> like it's incredible and, like so like their content person like who would you know be like filming it they were just like because like this is after coach this is after they put out um uh van zier like this is just like an, a, a sit down like this isn't going to be like on a zoom or anything she's like well i'm going to keep the camera rolling like you should show him the clock and we want to see his reaction <laughs> now this is going to be another cincinnati red bulls tape that just gets buried in the bowels of the <laughs> um, <laughs> you're see this tape. he um you know he and there's a few things like within it so like yes he's seen the clock and like i kind of like gave him a few hours I was like so like, did you know that they have a clock he's like yeah i'm like so like before i show it to you like you know that they have a clock he's like yeah like, <laughs> like yes i understand that they have a clock um so good and then um Chief, something that you said in this past episode where you said, like, he's a villain, I thought it was kind of funny because that was my exact question was like, you know, like, do you feel like you have a relationship? Because like when he was walking on the field, like he was dapping up some people and like some of them were FC Cincinnati like fans. So like, I don't know if they're whatever, but um, he does have some people here that he cares about. So it's like, you know, do you have any type of relationship or like do you kind of like see yourself as the villain in this rivalry now? And I thought it was just like funny, like using that word. Um, I don't think that he particularly viewed himself that way, but you saw like <laughs> part of the answer that he gave. And then like part of the answer, um, you know, that again, like just knowing the medium of MLSsoccer.com, I'm not, I'm just not going here on this, but I'll, you know, postcast exclusive here. He, um, he did, you know, go out of his way to mention, he's like, I don't care what they say about me and I don't care what they say about my family. And then I know that like back in the day, I can recall like, you know, maybe his family members were like kind of visible and yeah. I mean, like them being on Twitter and like, you know, maybe they were like vocal, but 
I felt like that was interesting. I felt mm. like fuck you, Frankie was very new. Like him booing when he touches, cheering when he gets a yellow. That's all. And you guys are the fans. You pay for everything. I'm not telling you what to do. Um, I, I, I'm entertained by the whole thing. But um, the fuck you, Frankie was new. And then him saying that was new, or at least that was news to me. I had never heard of like anybody crossing the line. And then when he scored the goal, something that's being overlooked here is he, you can clearly see, like he just audibly yells, fuck you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After 26,000 people are cursing your name for a good four minutes. I think that's natural, but like from your guys end, you know what I mean? Like, what are they saying in the stands or the streets, if you will, like, was this one just up a notch or was some, did somebody just take a shot at the fuck you Frankie Chan and caught on? Like what happened there? I, I, my guess would be without knowing what's in the minds of every single person that decided to, you know, voice their collective disdain for Frankie Amaya in that way. To me, this game going into it felt bigger because of what happened in the playoffs yeah. and every aspect of FCC versus Red Bull feels like it went up by one notch. And whereas most things between these two clubs were not great, people, you know, didn't like the Red Bulls, the way they play soccer, the flopping, that sort of thing. Frankie was already a, a notch higher than that. So if everything went up one notch, Frankie going up another notch moved it into a stratosphere of, I would say, almost a comedic level of, yeah. of hate and disdain going on, because it's always been there. It's always been this idea that he was the first player that really turned his back on what was going on here publicly. Like one of the few players, honestly, where it was not shy about saying, I don't want to be here. There's been rumblings of other players that may have had a bad breakup with the club, but it was a public bad breakup with him. And it's always been simmering. And I think that the Miazga situation and how all that went down, the other famous tape that will never be released <laughs> i feel like that pushed it into overdrive but I'm, I'm open to being wrong if kevin or grayson has a different thought on that i think you're right i i do think the one thing i'd push back on is the fuck you frankie chance i think we're there previously but i think it existed amongst uh the bailey hardcore mm. so if you were near the bailey or even in the bailey you definitely heard that uh, but to chief's point with red bull generally being taken up a notch i think more people were quick to jump on it just to be like this is how we're getting at this team we're gonna yell at this villain we're in so yeah i definitely think that's part of it in terms of his family though the only thing i can think of and I, this is not throwing anybody under the bus because I stand by 100%. Uh, KLR and Jonah, I think in particular, was proud of Frankie and Maya's family being fans of KLR and listening to him. And when it turned, I'm pretty sure Jonah gave a fuck you, whoever you can stop following us now oh, type wow. thing. <laughs> I could be wrong, and I want Jonah to come after me if that is not true. I have some recollection of that. I yeah. don't remember that. I remember there being a discussion about and I I think this is I think this is I think this has been like said publicly in some distributed um medium but i remember like i think that frankie's dad sent jonah like a dm at one point about the poster that jonah had made of frankie yeah. about like getting it and uh, a candle like art like the yeah. saint, saint frankie yeah. yeah yeah um and i think that it i think that that his that that it's that somehow that conversation just like kind of stopped when mm -hmm. Jonah was like getting ready to, you know, get, like package it up and like figure out, you know, where to send it. Um, and something somehow that just there was no follow through from somebody on that. And I think he's mentioned that as saying like, well, now he's not going to get it or something, <laughs> yeah, something, yeah. something <laughs> along those lines. Incidentally, I did see the St. Frankie banner this past weekend someone was like walking it out of northern rose saying we're taking this to go burn it and i don't know what happened to it from that point forward. i don't know if it was I burned i don't that. know if that was a joke kevin you witnessed this as we i were, saw that <laughs> like just somebody He's... with the banner is like come on we're taking this out to burn it i was like where and please take it away from cars and buildings before you do set, set this thing on fire I, so i think i think the fuck you frankie was louder 
than it's been. I know I've yes. heard it, but like I, my seats are not in the Bailey, but kind of toward the Bailey side. So, you know, maybe I was just able to hear it from that way. Um, but I'll say this. Um, you know, I think it's great that he said, fuck you guys. When he's when yeah. he scored, like in the you know, co- like like I can't hear you. Like clearly he could hear, but <laughs> but like but like you know, I think that's what you like. You know, you that's what you get, and it's part of it's part of like having that kind of back and forth. You know, like if you like fans are going to give it to players sometimes, and I think it's perfectly fine and frankly good. Yeah, so uh, when players give it back, I mean, there's lines that you that people can cross on either way, but I don't so like, maybe care that's, maybe about that's him yelling at the fans. Maybe that's a question for you, Tyler. Um, this would you say this is good for the? I would say this is good for the league. What would your take be as someone who covers this? Um, I don't know. I'm reminded of we just got off the NCAA women's set basketball thing, setting records, and one of the comments I was struck by is that. Caitlin Clark is so polarizing and people hate her a little bit, but that's so good for the sport of women's basketball, because finally we're moving past this kumbaya, let's all support one another. And there are actual feelings and actual, you know, hot takes being espoused. It feels like MLS could use more relationships like that, where players are just despised in a certain city. And there's a story to tell about a player that has this negative relationship with the fan base in that the fan base hates him and he's a villain in this particular city i think that's good what would what would your opinion on that be i completely agree i want whatever is going to bring more people into this you know as possible like not that fc cincinnati has any trouble selling tickets but the red bulls might um you know what i mean (laughs) and it's like whatever's going to just get more people interested i love storylines i love drama you know what i mean like and i I'm all for it. Um, and you know, he's a big boy too. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's there. He can take, he can take that heat. He can, you know, cuss right back at you. I thought that that was like kind of important for him. I don't want to be illuminating that in a way that like gets him fined or anything, but you know, you can see it on the tweet. He shouldn't uh, be fine. He shouldn't be, he shouldn't be fined for it. He's given a yeah. medal by the league for making things yeah. more entertaining. <laughs> and then, yeah. Like, you know, like giving him a chance, to, like say his piece, you know what I mean? Like, I just felt like that, that part about the family and just like, I didn't know it was hot there. I just want, really wanted to make sure like, as long as everybody knew and we're all on board for this and it is just in good fun, bring it on. You know what I mean? But like, if at any point the line was crossed or somebody out there owes somebody, you know, some type of understanding to close the loop, it might not be in good fun for him because like he was pretty, he was pretty icy. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't one of those, like, I don't mind being the villain. It's kind of funny to me. I think that's what most people would say, but for him, it was very like in out. If I would have offered him a handshake on the way out, I think he would walk right past me. Like he was, Hmm. he was pretty, you know, he's, he's upset about something or he's after the game and he doesn't want to talk to my dumb ass. (laughs) Um, But to your point, chief, you know what I mean? I think like a lot of guys want more fans in the stands. I think like more people, like every player at the end of the day, um, not every player, but a lot of players want to be loved. You know what I mean? And to be loved by your fans must mean being hated by others. And that is part of their job to like earn that. And when you're wearing the badge, you know what I mean? Like that, that's your job. You know what I mean? Like fight for your team, no matter what it means. And like Frankie's going to have this endless battle wherever he plays with FC Cincinnati. Great. I absolutely love it. Um, I saw a lot of the reaction and a little bit of conversation going of like, it's time to stop booing him and all of that. And it's just like, Okay, you know what I mean? Like he he did admit there that he was in the wrong for how he handled things. He was a 20 year old on a shitty team. And as you guys said, like, you know, as, as you're as as the fan, you know, I mean, like a, a vocal leader and what sets the tone for the conversation, the fans, you are entitled to whatever opinion you want. But if I'm him, I never wanted to be here. You know what I mean? Like he wanted to right. play for LAFC when he was getting right, drafted. Right. And then he gets put in this just dumpster, just unmitigated record breaking season after record breaking season i don't blame him for wanting better i think it was i think he had a little bit of stock with the usmnt at least at the u level and there was some relationship there that ruined it he's the first round draft pick you know he's going to sell some jerseys and just have these expectations that just were never realistic i personally don't blame him for wanting to leave um you can you know we, we can certainly disagree there but like i there's a lot of people like who were quote tweeting that saying like 
I'm like, I'm glad he's taking ownership. It's time to move on. She's like, no, no, no. You can still boo him. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. He's right. Still, yeah. play for your team when you guys needed him most. You know what I mean? Like, there's that. Like, two things can be true. Like, this team sucked. I don't want to be on it. And I, it's my job to make this better. And I want to be a leader. He could have taken that road too and chose not to. Yeah. yeah. So I think on, I think you hit, nothing you said I disagree with. Um, but I think that like, what, what some people don't want, maybe don't want to acknowledge or, or discount is that like he may have an entirely justifiable perspective and like you could make really good, like really good reasons for why he did um, what he did. But there's really like two things to that, right? Like us as fans are coming at it from a different perspective, right? <laughs> so like, so like I think we are allowed, like you said, to feel however we feel about it, you know, like your ex may have really good reasons not to, want to date you anymore but that doesn't mean like you don't get to like be mad about it right she's right <laughs> she was so right yeah like, um, you know I it's, would, it's a little, I it's, would, a little it's, it's like a little i don't know it's a little like i think it lacks a little bit of like self-respect to just be like no you're right yeah you, you should treat me that way <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know. but I but to and the, the second point on it is um before you make like, that second point i would yeah. note though the the best villains really do have a reason for being evil they do believe yeah, they're the yeah, hero right. of their own story sorry right. <laughs> no that's that's exactly right like yeah um and the second the second piece is um so like the the clock the clock bit right yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of just like a formality when you like move on to be like oh i thank the city thank the fans thank the club you know thank the staff you know whatever it's like everybody does this all the time and it might be like you might not mean it, right? But it's like a box you check, just like not celebrating a goal against the team you just left. Like when Andrew Gutman scored against us for Atlanta, Atlanta. I want to yeah, say he a like, legend. Andrew he Gutman. didn't he didn't <laughs> celebrate. And um, I think it's a little bit of a dumb tradition to be like, oh, you can't celebrate on your old team because like you don't play for them anymore, and you know celebrate your goals. But like. It's so expected that it's conspicuous when you do celebrate the goal. I think yeah. you <laughs> definitely consider the situation there. Like Frankie, for sure. Frankie, for sure, can he's celebrate. Got, he's got this. But like, let's say um, in the MLS, there's my, there might not be a ton of great examples. And like, I, I don't think the Brandon example would be quite there. But like, let's say you're a guy. I'm just going to make up a fictitious example. Like a guy who gets um, you make a name for yourself at Luton Town and then liverpool buys you you know what i mean you're part of a giant you're beating up on you know you're just pitiless old team there is a level to it where it is just like yo 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 or especially the first one you know what i mean like there will be more right. to come i want to you know at some point i'll break it but it's it's a gentleman's act i think in some situations um brandon not doing it at least on his first goal personally i liked it i i thought that that was a classy move um, but they run into each other next year and he just sticks it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Like game on, you know what I mean? Like you guys started booing him. Um, the moment's over or like maybe like in baseball when like, you know, somebody will come back to town and for their first at bat, they'll take off their helmet. They only do that one time. If they choose to do it, great. But it would be ridiculous if they did it every time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would get patronizing at a certain point. It's like we're all allowed to move on. Like we understand time moves forward here. I I, I, I do. I do not really for success is what I'm going to say. Like it's, the other thing is like when when he like all you guys want to see is FC Cincinnati score goals. You do not want to see anybody score goals on FC Cincinnati. So any no. to Correct. do that is going to get them. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do, do I, I don't really understand it. I just thought the conversation that it started in Twitter, um, yeah. a lot of people just feeling a lot of different ways. And, uh, you know, Grace, and you, thank you for you know sharing where you stood, but I didn't know if like we were really covering that one off because Kevin, I saw you getting into it. Uh, Chief, I saw you say like he didn't win shit, but like. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, like, I don't know if, you know, what I mean, like if there if there even is a button to put on it or if this is a story that will have no end, this is just another chapter and it's not quite ready to be bookended to. But I didn't know if there were any final conclusions of like what is right and wrong if we live in a black and white world on this. You know, I just I just think it's it's it can't ever get to the point where it's be it's mean spirited at this point. It's. 
it's almost like pro wrestling at this point. You're booing yeah. the bad guy, and he is the heel in this relationship. I know he's not going to embrace it, because if he was going to embrace it, what he would have done upon seeing the clock was sarcastically put out a thank you post. Thank you, fans of Cincinnati, with a shot of him scoring the goal to like <laughs> check the box for thanking. But it sounds like, you know, we'll just keep booing him until he goes with the bit. That would be my uh, that would be my suggestion. Yeah. 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 I, I don't think there's I don't think there's any end to it, nor should there be unless by some miracle he ends up back on FC Cincinnati like he it's just an inevitability that he is going to be our villain. And I will say especially if he plays for New York Red Bull, because I maintain they are our number two rival in MLS. And I I think that these games are always feisty. They both tend to be good teams overall. So we should be facing them in, you know, meaningful competition, both in the regular season and postseason and maybe cup competitions down the line. So, yeah, I think I think there will always be that animosity. And to be clear, like, the clock is a joke. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm not actually like looking at it every morning being like, ah, oh, damn you, Frankie, you saw and thanked us. <laughs> like, like genuinely, when we moved our website from one host to another, we tried to find a home for the actual HTML code of the clock and it was accidentally put into the website's footer. And so now it is on literally every page <laughs> of the entire website. That was entirely an accident. And once we realized it, I told our, our web guy, do not change it. That's way funnier. So that's, that's God working in mysterious ways. You yes. Know, you know, every, every, like it's just like every every good joke. Like as you say, you know, it is a joke. But like every good joke, every really good joke has a tinge. Of yes. Truth. You know what I mean? And like this is something that just uniquely belongs to you guys. And as you shared with the FC Cincinnati supporters and just everybody's in on it. That's a creation that you guys have made that's just going to have so much impact and it's just going to keep on giving for years. So yeah. congratulations on you for an unexpected home run there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, he got to leave the shitty team, all right? We <laughs> didn't, okay? <laughs> we had to keep going. <laughs> so uh, maybe maybe there's some jealousy with it, all right? I don't know how to pick Red Bull of all the teams, but, you know, I, I th maybe there's something there. Um, no, we've... We've already taken more time than I thought of you, but I could not get you out of here with at least asking one or two MLS Next Pro questions. I know the last couple of years you've sort of lived and breathed this world. I don't know if you're quite in that world these days, but I will say generally as an FCC fan, um, I don't watch every FCC 2 game. I, I've been to one game in person for them. But in general, when sort of keeping tabs and looking at the table and things like that, I don't see them doing well. And the last <laughs> time we saw Tyron Marshall on a big stage, he was the interim manager where he lost eight or nine matches straight uh, to finish out albeit a tough situation. I'm not going to blame him too much. Uh, but then we see the team isn't doing that hot. So I'm curious from your perspective as an FCC fan or just FCC fans generally, is there reason to be concerned here? Because at the same time, I'm seeing some of the young talent come through this team. It looks pretty good. So I'm not sure where to gauge the success here. Yeah, I mean, you can, it like, I don't, I'm not saying this sarcastically, but I mean, it's not like such an asshole when I say it. It means whatever you think it means. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I just don't think it be, like, you're allowed to have whatever opinion you want. And like, I think that there's a lot of different points of emphasis, not to compare FC Cincinnati 2 to FC Cincinnati's first team in 2019. I'm not saying it's that, but I do think there's a little bit of like that might have existed before an optimum time mm -hmm. um and like the planning for mls next pro like i don't know i wasn't you know i didn't work there before it existed but like we have to remember like when usl like started like kicking out mls second teams was like in like 2019 um my understanding and like you know like, you know with club leaders and just like you know even people like on the admin side of it that i've talked to you know i've never heard anything other than like all of our resources are on the first team mm -hmm. and in a perfect world, Cincinnati two maybe debuts this year or sits it out like, like DC still not in it. Montreal still isn't in it. And then you see other teams that have kind of like, kind of like let other markets have it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. so like this rebrand or sorry, not, not to go too far away from the point. Um, so with, with Tyrone, it's like, I know him and Chris are like very close. Um, yeah. 
I don't know if results really matter. And that's kind of like, there's two sides of the coin here. Cause like Tyrone and I'm thinking that Tyrone might need to get out of the way either way. One of these days, because like, if he doesn't want to be, if he wants to be an MLS manager one day, and this is supposed to be him developing, like his all time record is like hilarious. Like my friend Mark tweeted about it last year. I don't know if you guys remember it, but like it made the rounds and it was like, it was, what I'll, I'll find the tweet and send it to you so like you guys can mention it, but like it was, it was really, really bad. So if he's trying to develop as a manager or like at least like a head coach, I, I don't think this is doing a lot for him. And then Kevin, as you said, like the talent development's been there, but then like you've seen a lot of other teams have a lot more success. Yeah. And like, I think like if you're, if you're doing that and you're making this a developmental thing, then you're kind of playing money ball, not to like rub crew and crew to success, like in your face. But like when you can call up Patrick Schulte on a homegrown deal, making $80,000 a year, let go of Eloy room, who is making literally $580,000 a year <laughs> and go win MLS cup. That's fantastic. FC Cincinnati hasn't done that. Um, Mo Farsi was making the league minimum at like $76,000 a year at the right wing back spot. By the end of the season, he's starting over Julian Gressel. You know what I mean? Yeah, like he was right, making yeah. like in the $800,000 range. Um, he was on a one year deal. It was a show me year. He was playing great with them. I think we all you know saw that. But um, what happens if he doesn't get benched? You know what I mean? Like the crew might have planned on him. Like he might not have gone to Miami. He might have been like, I want this job on this defending champion team but like he got outdone by a crew to alum um so like how much money does that make i mean like i you add the change like eight hundred thousand and change you know times two times whatever with like the jason Russell rose the max arsons like everybody else that crew two has had so cincinnati isn't excelling in that but i don't know if their starting place was as good as crew two like 2022 was both of their first year but crew two has obviously had an academy for much longer they've already had like the infrastructure the staff just the everything I don't know if it's a fair judge, but again, as the people who pay for everything, you guys are the ones are the reason it exists. And I think it would be awfully cruel to start like publicly calling for Tyrone's head. But if you can make a fair point to how it's holding the team back, I think, you know, the club will be willing to listen. Or if the whole thing is like Tyrone's just caretaking this until they can get serious about it with that rebrand coming. I, I know it sounds like an excuse and maybe not something that they would want to admit, but I would kind of buy it, you know? I got to, I got to take a little bit of the credit away from the crew that you just gave them. Okay. Uh, Ooh, I'm good. pretty sure Schulte was not a homegrown. I think he was a generation Adidas draft pick. You're, you're correct. You are 100%. Um, yeah. So I just don't want them to get the credit for developing Schulte. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fucker he saved was, two penalties in Champions in, uh, League last yeah, night. Yeah, I know. He's doing, I know he's doing great. Don't get her tell me. And he, he was a crew too. There that whole first season, right, yep. uh, he was like their best eleven, like all, all that. Like he he was technically right. developed, you know, like in that in the halls of the Laurent Courtois brainchild. So yeah, yeah. Roman would have been a FC two player if Al Conte didn't get hurt. hurt. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. um the, the other piece was I, I'm pretty sure crew have like a like a separate like GM and maybe even like technical director for crew two. They do. Which I've found interesting that we don't that we don't <laughs> have that. <laughs> well, it they did have an open job posting for it like four or five months ago. Oh really? Okay. Ooh, yeah, like, I missed lucky. that. Yeah, so like it was there, and then there was like another job, or no, 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 no. it wasn't um, a second team GM, but it was another role, like a front office role, and then it said like support FC Cincinnati GM, support FC Cincinnati two GM. So like that implies uh, that it's either there, it's being built, or it's just like a vacancy that they know that they have, but it's part of the ecosystem. So yeah, um, and to your point, Grayson, all the teams that have that infrastructure do a lot better than the teams that don't. So that's another thing where it's like, what are we judging FC Cincinnati on? We all want to see them win. We all want to see them, you know, make affordable players that free up the roster, but it, it just, it just might not be judgment day yet, man. So yeah. what is sort of the secret sauce to succeeding in MLS next pro? Is it just time? Is it having enough time for young talent to come through your Academy and graduate up to your MLS next pro? Or is there something that FC Cincinnati isn't doing that they could do that would make that next pro squad better? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a hundred recipes for chicken soup, right? But one thing that FC Cincinnati doesn't do that I really wish that they would do, and I haven't watched a ton of second team this year, but historically they've been very married 
to like the three, five, two or whatever the first team's trotting out that week. Mm. Whereas a lot of other teams, they just put their players in a position and say, figure out how to win this game. Like that's just mm. the second team philosophy. And I think that that develops the character. You can see who's going to put on the cape. You can see who's going to stay home for the benefit of the team. And you get to just see the players kind of like be themselves. It's not necessarily about winning, but the better teams just tend to let their players be a little bit more free. And like, they will have like a youth coach specialist who is not, trying to move up. You know what I mean? Like you guys have been following the sport for years. Like, you know, that there's just certain people who just belong in the, you know, under the first team level, they know it. they're not trying to be anything different. Um, and so, yeah, like if you're trying to mimic the first team, like what I've seen, it's just like, like maybe like Brett Halsey would be the best example. And like, how long has it taken him to like really look good? I would argue like he, he looked pretty good in like Conca cap. Like, I don't, I can't remember him doing anything like great last year. Like when he earned that call up, um, you're just not ready for the size, you know what I mean? The speed and just like everything. If you're playing in that formation, I think that the easy thought is like, oh, well, they're going to be ready. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Jimmy Ordonez is going to be ready when Lucho whips in a ball that he didn't even know was possible, you know, to <laughs> him, like that kind of thing. It's just like, I just don't know that the formation thing helps. I just think like soccer is like a little bit more of a fluid sport. And like, I think that the, to your point, Chief, like, just to answer your question, like, I don't know that there's a secret sauce just because every team's like doing something different, but I like to see the teams that just play more open, let the kids figure it out. And then they kind of determine the brand of football. And then like the individuals really shine there rather than like, just kind of like being confined and reducing their skill set to stuff that they might not, they might not, that might not be their idea of, you know, what they want to do with their life, you know? Does that make yeah. sense? Or am I like, yeah. no, it, it's, it's fascinating to me because it, it's soccer development. It's just it's on one hand, there's an internal logic to the idea of, oh, you want them to grow up in the same system that the first team is going to play. But also, I can absolutely see the idea, too, that if you do that, you're never going to identify who is the talent that jumps off the paper at you. So it's just it's interesting to me. And I feel like as an FC Cincinnati fan, there is so much of what we've been conditioned to say is, oh, we're very new. It's we didn't have the time to do this right. We didn't have the time that other teams have had to do this. But the hour's getting a little late where, <laughs> you know, 2019 is further in the rearview mirror with every year that we go along. And the idea of, well, you know, they still need time is, well, you've had time at this point. And this is a this is a really vital aspect of building sus sustainable success over the long term in a salary capped league. And I don't know enough about it to know why I should be whether or not I should even be upset as to what's <laughs> what's going on at the two level there. Yeah, I mean, like, and like overall, I think like the league itself is still new and it's there to experiment. And, uh, you know, I can't agree with everything it does. You know, what I mean, like, so, but like I will say it's like good spirit and that like it is ambitious and. It's just it's just a goofy thing overall that I think it's just it's a, it's a new league with different rules in the world of soccer. So, like. I don't know that like it means anything even for a team to like have a dynasty of anything other than like developing talent. I want to be the team that, you know, I've sent up first five team players that are still on like have like a minimum lifespan of three years, or I've sold a player that just funded the entire second team operation for 10 years. Those would kind of be my goals over winning. Um, but then like elsewhere in the league, just like the best examples, like a Ben him in Kramoski. He might've been like the second most popular player, like in MLS next pro or either in MLS, like, Jesus Christ on Miami last year, like after, you know, McKee, you know, really got to do his thing and just blossom. And it's like, that's a product of next pro um, and Charlotte, Patrick, Ajimong, like it, it is possible. Cincinnati just hasn't hit yet, but they're in the majority of groups that haven't figured it out, you know? Yeah. So I'm not saying that they're keeping pace. Like they are, they are consistently like last or second to last. That doesn't look good, but there's a lot of teams like who don't even have a Brett Halsey to show for yet. If that makes you feel any better. Mm -hmm. Will the rebrand make things suddenly great? Because <laughs> um, I've sure. learned throughout sports history, as long as you rebrand at the right time, it can launch you into the stratosphere. <laughs> Look good, play good. How did you guys feel about that? And like, I, I know I just looked at the clock. I don't want to overstay my welcome. What, what I will say is like, it, it's fine. It's whatever. A new thing. It's just it's just not far enough away for me. And like, I really like the Nashville Huntsville model. A lot and i wish like cincinnati and again like other teams have to bid for this like other other cities would have to want this and attract it from cincinnati but like why not play it in florence why not play it in dayton why not play it in lawrenceburg you know what i mean like places where 
the, like the community will have a little bit more ownership. NKU is like less than 10 miles away from Tiki Bell Stadium. It's not uh, going to win the competition for your attention. You know what I mean? It, it, it just won't. And it's not there by design. So like, I don't get the effort of this rebuild unless there is a relocation. But from my understanding, this is not confirmed. This is just what somebody told me last year is that there is no plan to like move it anywhere like further south to where like that identity makes any more sense. So I like it. Cool. You get to buy new merch. It's a new thing to support. Um, you know, there's there's a little bit of fun in the fanfare of that. But to me, it means nothing. Um, but I'm an aggressive, stoic, neutral, and I don't know how to have fun. So I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mind it. Um, I did think it was odd that they didn't go after Dayton. And I don't wonder if it is a, uh, like a gentleman's agreement with Columbus that they'll they'll both leave that market alone and maybe Columbus puts their team in Cleveland if they go that route or something. But um, yeah, I don't like Northern Kentucky generally makes sense to try to give it its own identity. I just don't think there's enough in Indiana, like population wise to make sense. Whereas like Northern Kentucky is very much a part of Cincinnati and the greater Cincinnati area. But I do think that there's enough local pride. And I think the Florence y'alls are a good example of this where like, yeah, there, there probably is something to that. I do think if they could have pulled it off playing in the y'all stadium, what actually would have been kind of clever, but I don't, I don't think whatever that arrangement would have looked like would have pleased everybody involved so um we love soccer yeah. on a baseball field right mm-hmm. look you know what <laughs> louisville seems pretty successful they got their start there you know <laughs> and hey maybe um, we'd play better yeah. at uh we'd play better at yankee stadium if we were training our two team on a baseball that's a field. good point <laughs> yeah, we struggle there ready for anything yeah there's like a mound in the middle of the field like these guys know how to do stuff you know what i mean you can <laughs> send the one send the ones down from milford to train at the florence y'all's field for a week just before the <laughs> <laughs> NYCFC, and you'll be ready for anything when you hit Yankee Stadium. I also thought Milford would have been a good idea. They have that practice mm. field. I don't know if you guys have like been out there, but like it has a little bit of a grandstand, it, like something that could totally facilitate the crowd that they get at NKU, and then call it the Milford Maniacs or something. Like make it youth centric because there's a lot of like you know club teams out there. It invites a lot of Cincinnati fans to see the training facility, something that they might not have done otherwise. I kind of like yeah. it too, but. I'm not here to revise history. It's going to be Commonwealth FC. It sounds like it's staying at AU. <laughs> That's what it is. There's no point in talking about my crazy theories. So. Well, look, if there's an opportunity to throw a second brand idea out there, I'm begging FCC, the Northern Kentucky, or I'd even go Covington Blue Sox, an old Federalist League baseball team. I think it's an old-timey name. It's a baseball town. You put the Blue Sox. I'd do whatever you want with the kit, but they always wear Blue Sox. I think it'd be clever. I think it'd be a nod to history. I think it'd be fun. Um well, yeah, Tyler, my gosh, we've gone long, my man. Yeah, this was sorry. a really great conversation. No, I've had I've had a blast. I finally looked over at the clock here, and I've realized how long we've we've kept you uh, from your life. So, um, no, man, this was so much fun. We definitely have to have you back on. Maybe when you write, who's who's the next villain for FCC World? Maybe when you have, uh, I don't know, an article on a... Fun. Yeah, or an article on a referee, I think would be good. Then we can, we can have <laughs> the you third on. team. I buy on a referee. <laughs> That's what we got to do. We got to. We'll we'll open this up to the Discord in the comments. We need to pick a new villain on another team so Tyler can interview them. So yes, we'll figure it out, and then they can be really confused as why they came to Cincinnati and everybody suddenly started hating them. <laughs> Well, I think we can already decide it's whichever the first DP San Diego signs. Okay, clearly, that's clearly. that's All who right. we hate. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. No, Tyler, thank you so much for coming on, man. Absolutely, anytime, guys. Huge thank you to Tyler Stice for coming on the show. That was uh, a really fun conversation. I told him we'd talk for a half an hour, and uh, boy, did we not do that. So um, <laughs> that was that was a really good conversation. Us hey, go long, surely you jest. I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, no, it was a great conversation. I had a lot of fun with that. Um, we had now to FC Cincinnati and their match this weekend against... CF Montreal, Enter de Foot Montreal, or whatever the Club hell. Club de Foot. Club de Foot de Montreal, <laughs> uh, CF. Um, yeah, this is not your Wilfred Nancy, Nancy 
uh, Montreal anymore. Historically, this has always been a, a wild matchup between these teams. However, it's not that far off from, from uh, uh, Nancy's teams. It was Crew 2's manager who moved uh, over to Montreal this past offseason uh, to take over for them. Uh, Laurent Simon? Do I have that no, right? No, Laurent Courtois. Laurent Courtois. I, I'm thinking of the uh, the center back, the French center back that floated around in the Trevor. What a same thing. <laughs> I'm going to say he's probably French, French, Belgian. Yeah, Yeah, there you go. Okay. (laughs) Um, Boy, man, that was just that was a comedy of errors in that exchange right there. And see, if Grayson wasn't on the podcast this week, that would have gone uncorrected because I just would have never known. And you would have had a wildly different person in charge of Montreal. New CF Montreal manager, Laurent Kochelny. (laughs) <laughs> it's like that Lauren, bit on Lauren John, Hill. It's like that <laughs> bit on John Oliver where he's like, You didn't even notice that isn't actually Luxembourg. Luxembourg is over here. <laughs> uh, you know, Laurent Courtois, which is a weird one, right? So just to, you know, if the uh I maybe extra time touch on this, I feel like a more robust MLS media would have absolutely skewered Montreal for this dumb move. They had Wilford Nancy, who was already being recognized in Montreal as one of the best and brightest coaching minds in MLS. They fire him, let him go. He quit. They, so he was under contract. Okay. They were not going to pay him more money. Okay. So they allowed him to. I think. I think. I think Columbus had to play, had to pay some like compensation to Montreal. Okay, but like they just let him go to another Eastern Conference team while he was <laughs> under contract because they weren't going to pay him because they just didn't want to pay him any more money. Yeah, and and I'm, I'm be- sure in typically francophone um, style, they were just immediately dismissive of his request. It's like, <laughs> more money? No, none, <laughs> no. <laughs> And uh, Nancy, I want to say that after that season was like in the running, was maybe a finalist for coach of I the year. I think he was a finalist for coach of the year. I think Montreal finished second. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. they had finished near bottom of the table. It was like they had maybe made a bigger jump in points than we did in 22, yeah. like 21 yeah, to 22. It's just wild. Uh, yeah, second, I want to say they made it to the Eastern Conference final. Even uh, can, can we? Can we will Wilfred Nancy to take a better job somewhere again? Can I like mean, can he become the new head coach at Kentucky? Can we make, <laughs> can we make that happen? No, there's a deal. I, get I leagues mean, on this or something. Just get him out of this 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 league. Look, if you're a Greg Berhalter hater. You obviously also hate MLS, but you could do a lot worse than Wilfred Nancy. So they did not make as big of a jump from 21 to 22 as we did, but they were terrible in 21 and finished with 65 points uh, in 22. Damn. Yeah. Very impressive work. Um, so anyway, the I bring that up because Courtois was a assistant with Montreal, with Wilfred Nancy then. He moves to Columbus, brings Courtois with him. Courtois ends up being the head coach of Columbus Crew 2. And we touched on a little bit with Snipes there, but Crew 2 goes on to win MLS Next Pro in fairly dominant fashion and, yeah, promotes a lot of guys up to the first team. Um uh, Montreal in the meantime hires Lasada, uh, who was a failed manager after like two seasons in DC. It was a very bizarre hire, and then they go and turn around and hire Wilfred Nancy's assistant coach to be the head coach after essentially letting Nancy walk out the door. What? This is insane like this is the, one of the most mismanaged things i've ever seen from a professional sports franchise you just don't understand the french kevin <laughs> i mean joey <laughs> saputo i believe is the uh the manager or the owner there um bizarre bizarre fella he's like weirdly aggressive i'm pretty sure he got adrian healy fired from uh or no not adrian healy it was um Whoever was covering um, MLS uh, 
in French, I want to say, or maybe did like radio commentary for them, uh, but got this guy fired because he was critical of how Montreal was managing their business here. Um, so he's was, like the James Dolan of Canada is who we're talking about right here. Yeah. So weird. Just absolutely weird. Um I really enjoy this. Uh, Montreal plays their stadium. Is uh, Stade Saputo? Huh? <laughs> you gonna name? You gonna name your stadium after yourself? Huh? It's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> it's pretty baller. <laughs> the Carl Linder. I mean, West End you stadium. say that like the Bengals didn't spend years playing at Paul Brown Stadium, like famously denying Hamilton County the ability to have <laughs> additional revenue from sta- naming rights for the stadium. At least it was his dad. It wasn't him. (laughs) You know, you can at least say like, oh, we're honoring, you know, history and tradition or something. And then as soon as they needed to pay Joe Burrow, it was like, oh, Paycor, how much do you have money that we can use? (laughs) I've been to Stade Saputo before. Yes, that's right. You've been on on the ground. How was it? um, It feels very high school, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Like, I was shocked by how not nice it was. It was if MLS 1.0 was playing in big NFL cavernous facilities, this is an MLS 2.0 facility. It's got a lot of the same DNA as historic cruise stadium where it's a lot of bleachers. Mm-hmm. Um, you go underneath the uh, the concourses and it's it feels like you're underneath a high school stadium getting concession stands. <laughs> Although they have just absolutely fabulous poutine being served from food trucks. And then okay. right next to it, they don't have enough bathrooms. They have to bring in the trailer bathrooms that like they cart in on the back of a big rig. <laughs> it's a great place. I It would be high on my list for an away days at some point. Okay. I would agree with that. I think Montreal would be a really fun team. I feel like we always play them like midweek, though. It's always very annoying for the schedule. Um, But not this time. So we screwed that one up. So way to go, us. Um, Yeah, Montreal uh, currently sitting outside of a playoff position, although you're going to be shocked to hear this. (laughs) It is April. They've scored one more goal than us. So um, they've got that going for them. They've given up 13 goals, which a quick eye looks like the second most in the Eastern Conference after Chicago. Uh, They're on a three game losing streak. How do we feel about this one? They just lost good. five nothing to Seattle. They picked up two red cards in their last three games. That's always a great sign. They I have like given that. up. They've played what six games. They've given up three or more goals in half of them. God, if the offense can't get right in this game, <laughs> please. <laughs> the love of Mont- Montreal Montreal games are like always. Yeah, they're always a disaster. I don't know why. It's always a huge cluster. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like this you got to look at this as a bounce back game, right? Like this, yeah. this is, has to be your bounce back game. Yeah, this is this is a bad team. They should not make the playoffs so far this season. They've shown us to be a bad team. Um, they do have a couple of wins against, I mean, they beat inner Miami three to two. It was kind of a screwy game on that one, but yeah, like this should be no, no messy. Yeah, right. There was, there was no messy on that one. Uh, on the XG table, according to fought mob, they are dead last in the East. So, we're they're also sixth, a, they're also the a way, team that will not be benefiting from the MLS roster rule changes as they only have one DP. I believe it's still women. Women. Yama. Not women. Yama. When Yama. One Yama. One yeah, Yama. Sorry. Yama. God damn it. <laughs> the other European. <laughs> right. The, significantly shorter than the other. <laughs> the other Victor. Yeah. Um, they, so they do only have one DP and it's oh, I think they only have one and it's one Yama. But. Um, they do have like a couple of annoying guys. They yeah. got like Samuel P. at Canadian International, very annoying. Um, they have Joseph Martinez, who I've has been him. known to put a to put a ball to the back of the net against the FC a time or two. Um, and I, mean, I don't know anything about this player, but I just want to I just want to call him out. They have a guy named Grayson Duty. 
<laughs> it feels like they're mocking you. <laughs> Grace and Duty, also uh, the name of your column, right? Just yeah, right. <laughs> there, this is a story that like three it's people- It's my average will... review on Apple Podcasts. This, this is basically a story just for Schwai, but there was a game in the USL days of when the two of us were in the Bailey together, and there was a guy with the last name Duty that was playing on the other team. And the most annoying person you would ever stand by at a game who thought she was the most clever person ever for deciding that this player's name was Duty and that was funny, just kept drunkenly chanting to herself, wipe the duty, and then like cracking herself up for an entire game. And I have never wanted to be relocated to a different section of the stadium faster. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the kind of clever quick-witted thinking we're gonna need in order to beat this team i think we can all agree with that uh, um, i just want to point out that so brandon just scored against inter miami in champions league cool drake calendar like wasn't even under pressure just seemingly kicks the ball to brandon who's alone in the box for no reason <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh my god, I just watched <laughs> Like that was like a Jameis Winston interception to a linebacker he just didn't see. Brandon is shocked this happened. <laughs> this oh feels ma this He's feels match fixing there. This feels match fixy. <laughs> yeah. Like it super does. match fixy. And I will say <laughs> if this was happening in a in a foreign league, I would be probably more convinced it was match fixing. Which tells you more about me than about the play. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the kind of real time reactions you get when you listen to the postcast. We're talking about games you aren't even looking at. Kevin, what say you about this CF Montreal game? How many goals does the FC need to score for this not to be a disaster on mm. uh, Sunday night when we record? I mean, what's what's the least amount that they could score that we'd still be mad about? Is it one goal? Would we still be mad if they scored one goal on the road? Or do they need to score two in this game? Given how I really bad feel Montreal's like you need defense two. is, they need to score two. Two, okay. And I'll be honest, depending on how they look and depending on how the two come, <laughs> might, might, be, be <laughs> might be not satisfied with two. <laughs> so that's a good point. Is it... Keeper stands on his head. It's an incredible performance, but it was well worked offense. It was, you no, know, the, the ball needs to go in the back of the oh, net. Okay, we've we've okay. moved beyond. They look dangerous. <laughs> I'm going to say they need to score at least two goals. OK. And the only way I'm satisfied with two goals is if Bupenza and Baird and the strikers score both those goals. I was going to say, if Miazga and Robinson score three goals between them, no, I, don't, that's, I still that's don't a think we're happy. That's yeah. a disappointing <laughs> night. That's the lead on Sunday's on Monday's postcast is great win, great to see them score. The forwards are still a problem, and the offense is still a problem. Yeah. So um, it's a must-score game for Aaron Bupenzo. I'm going to throw that out there. He is, in a country, he is in a country that speaks his native language. He should be... At home, walking around, dealing with the average citizenry, he should be comfortable in this game. I am, I'm going to have to put Aaron Bupenza on notice if we don't get a goal from him in this game. Okay. Uh, we'll write a letter to FCC HR if he doesn't score. He's on notice. That's, I don't, whatever, whatever, whatever consequences you want to attribute to that, he's just going to be on notice if he doesn't score this game. I'd love corporate culture being applied to, an athletic team like if he doesn't score he gets put on like a performance improvement plan where he has yeah. to check he's in on with athletic Noonan. probation yeah <laughs> um okay so with that grayson what do you think will happen one nothing to montreal no, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> oh, the energy is all wrong on that. The energy is all wrong. It feels right, though. <laughs> uh, probably no Celentano again. It feels likely yeah, he, at this he said point. He's, he's out. Do we see, does Evan get the second starter or is it up to Allie this next game? I have a feeling I it's going to be Khan. Uh, I think it's going to be Evan. 
I hope so. Uh, first, definitely off, that could be Khan. Might be Can. Yeah, I was gonna say, man, I, I really wanted to correct a keeper pronunciation there. No, um, he's, I'm just I've given up at this point. <laughs> Fair enough. He is um, who he is. I could see it being Ken, um, but I hope it's Evan. So do I. Because I'm biased. <laughs> I'm so gonna... I'm gonna say this: if it is Evan, mm-hmm. I'm gonna oh, predict. Like this. I'm gonna predict one nil to the FC. Ah, oh, guys, that's still if not good enough. If it's Alec, uh, I'm gonna say one-one draw. Wow! Balls, in, balls in your court, Pat. Mm. Mm. I'm gonna say FCC wins three to nothing. Evan Loro with the clean sheet. Bupenza gets two. Baird gets one. Baird buries a bicycle kick, and it's all we ever wanted. And we think, damn, maybe it was just small sample size. This team's going to be okay. Maybe this team just needs to play all its games in Canada. This is just w- entirely wish fulfillment over here. All right. I read the secret. Okay. I know how to make things happen. We're going to get there. Um, so, yeah. Well, one of those will happen. That's a guarantee. And we'll talk about it on next week's episode. Um, you know, we're not playing this week. Go fuck yourself, San Diego. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Cincy Postcast. It is a production of The Post Cincy. You can check us out at thepostcincy.com or just click a link in the description to check out some of our written work. It also has links to our social media accounts across all sorts of different platforms, including YouTube, where we are trying to do more and more video content. Please, dare I say it, like and subscribe and leave a comment. Uh, but no, that would be really, really helpful. I also want to give a thank you to Jim Trace and the Makers. They're a local Cincinnati band who provided all of the music for this episode. We love having them on board. You can check them out. Again, link in the description of this episode to find out where they might be playing shows next or where you can listen to more of their music. Also want to give a massive, massive thank you to the awesome and very attractive patrons over on patreon uh it is a voluntary subscription that people take out with no real promise of anything extra that keep this show afloat and we are so so thankful to those of you that have decided to take that commitment if you do like the show or at least just want to engage with other people who have listened to the show and want to talk about fc cincinnati mls soccer or really anything else uh, you can go on over to discord again link in the description lots of links in the description where you can find a link to the discord that's where we are keeping the conversation going 24 7 it feels like it's a really fun group of people in there just talking about fc cincinnati and like i said just about everything else And finally, I'll say it. If you liked this episode and given the fact that you've made it all the way to the end, I have to assume you either like it or for some reason cannot reach the stop button. Please share this episode with a friend or family member or someone who likes FC Cincinnati. The best way for us to grow is from a personal recommendation from somebody who likes it. And if that's you, please tell other people. If you don't have any friends, feel free to give us a review on whatever your podcast platform of choices. We'll take anything we can get. But again, a huge, huge thank you to everybody for listening to the show. I am blown away that anybody listens to this. So again, I well and truly mean this. Thank you so much for listening.